Buenas noches. Good, good evening. Buenas noches. Thank you for everybody to being here. And we're going to go ahead and get started. The Crane School District understands that our community of schools is located on the ancestral land of the Otham Jude and Akama Otham people who descended from the Hohokam and have inhabited this land since time immemorial. The Otham, whose name translate literally to people, are a vibrant culture of community spanning countless generations into the past, continuing to thrive in the present, and carrying a powerful legacy for generations into the future. With this acknowledgement, the Creighton School District formally recognizes that the traditional care and keeping of these lands by Indigenous people is an aspirational model of community stewardship that we are committed to honor with our practices, policy, and human relations. And with that, Dr. Dupin will lead us into the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, nation, under God, God indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for all. Thank you. That brings us to roll call. All of us are here. Uh, Mr. Mann, Ms. Gibson McLean, Ms. Ayers, myself, Ms. McCaleb, and Ms. McSheffrey. We want to welcome everyone to tonight's meeting and remind the audience of the request to address board cards that must be completed and submitted to the board secretary if they wish to speak to an agenda item. Board policy provides for two cards, white cards to be submitted in order to speak to an agenda item and blue cards to be submitted in order to speak during public comments. Due to the open meeting law, board members are not allowed to address items that are not on the agenda and that's per policy BEDH. That brings us to the next, which is 2A, approval of agenda. I move the governing board approve the agenda as presented. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right, and that brings us to governing board reports. And I am gonna start with Ms. McSheffrey. I do not have one. Thank you. Um, Ms. McCaleb? Um, I, I don't really have one other than I know it's a really busy time for everybody. Azella testing's going on, all the fun things. So, um, and lots of rain all week. So please stay dry and stay safe. Thank you. Ms. Ayers? Yeah, just a couple things. I wanted to um, say congratu uh, good luck on the Azella test. I know people are getting ready for them. I know our students are getting ready uh, for them right now. Um, so good luck on those. And then just a personal note, I finally um, got all my stuff together and applied for my admin cert today. So hopefully done with that. <laughs> so I'm happy about that. Congratulations. Ms. Gibson McLean. Um, I don't have much other than um, we had another committee meeting last week. Things are going well. Another one coming up. You're always welcome to join us. Things are going great. Um, and went to the equity uh, and advocacy, equity conference advocacy symposium last week in Washington, D.C. Um, it was a lot smaller than some of the other things we've been to. I mean, Cube may be comparable, I guess. Um, and so anyway, I just, I found a lot of the stuff at the equity symposium very relevant and helpful to kind of the work that we do here. The advocacy thing was like a lot of information, but not a lot of discussions. So I did appreciate kind of the, the breakouts in the equity symposium better. But that being said, I thought it was still valuable information um, that we can use to our advantage here. And I don't, I don't, I, can, I guess I could come back with some more specific things. I definitely walked in here like two minutes before we started, so I apologize. <laughs> but thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> I just have a couple of things. Um, I want to congratulate the Biltmore Prep Tigers yesterday in their girls' basketball game. And my son has a daughter, uh, a daughter. My son has a best friend that plays there, so we were at the game yesterday. So, yay, that was nice to be there. Um, also, um, the Family Resource Center, thank you for the food distribution that they just did this week. We had 64 families um, that were there, so that's awesome. Our food distribution keeps getting bigger and bigger, so um, shout out to them for 
holding it down and you know there's only three individuals there and they make it happen for a community so that's awesome and yeah that's the only board report that i have and i'll switch it over to mr mann thank you so much i'm <clears throat> um i'm gonna withhold any comments on the conferences because i think we had, were posted for a discussion on on kind of our takeaways from that after this superintendent's report but i um i do enjoyed the conferences and uh, we'll share some more at that point um had the opportunity to be one of the judges along with let me move this backpack out of the way um some of our compatriots on the executive team and a few others from our curriculum team uh, for the district spelling bee um, on the 26th. And so i um, very excited that uh, one of our uh, students from the Creighton Academy will be representing the district at regionals. So, um, and we will, uh, we will endeavor to bring that person to a board meeting so that way we can more formally recognize them. So, um, and then speaking of formally recognizing people, we actually have Principal Fisher with us this evening, who has brought a very special student that you have read about in the Epic Kids publication. And so we'd like to take a moment to recognize her for her great accomplishment. And with that, I'm hoping Principal Fisher will be kind enough to introduce her and her family um, to the board and share a little bit about, she had a compatriot who couldn't be here this evening. We're still working, um, getting her to be able to be here. Thank you so much, Madam President, members of the board and executive council. We are very excited to have Arlen Aguilar Hernandez with us tonight. One of two of our students who had art represented at the state fair. Arlen's won third place in her category. It's called Dragon Eye. And Tigareta Kabrum won first place in her category called Golden Dreams. And we're very excited to have these both displayed at Excellencia for their great work as well as we will be, make them a permanent purchase eventually. So anything you want to say about the process? <laughs> okay. We're excited because not only has our art program been able to do some really stellar art pieces and have them compete both in the community um, as well as in the district, but we will be having uh, student art displayed at the Tempe Arts Fair coming up. So please take a chance to look at some of those as well. Um, just some great things happening in the art world. Yeah. Can we, would it be okay if we took a moment to get a picture with the board? Oh, good. Awesome. I warned her that was coming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you you were wise. Don't grab your piece. La familia puede venir también si gustan salir en la foto. I'll hang by my <laughs> Do we need to like scoot in? Tighten up. This way? Yes. I mean, <clears throat> um, can, can I get you two just in the back? Oh, yep. Come in. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that works. That works. Okay. One, two, three. Yay. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations on your artwork y muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Qué talentosa hija tienen ustedes. Gracias por venir. And, and one of the things I'd like to, to point out about this, and I think it's something we need to do more of, you know, we've had our student outcomes focused governance work discussions, and I know we're posted to have more conversation on that tonight. And one of the things that's come up often in the district is you know, even though we may not be fans of the way the testing's handled, it's the only measure that we currently have. And we're always looking for those other measures that we can use to see our students being successful. And so I wanna thank our student this evening um, and our principal for giving us another type of measure that we can look to, which is our students' success in the arts, which are absolutely as important as all of the other measures that we use so so thank you very much to the family and thank you to our wonderful student gracias and with that i will conclude my comments for this evening thank you mr mann and that brings us over to our next agenda item which is the nsba equity synopsis advocacy and institute reports 
Myself, Ms. Gibson McCling, and Ms. McSheffrey, along with Dr. Dupin and Mr. Mann, attended this national conference, and we're going to give you guys some feedback of stuff that we liked. I know that Ms. Gibson McLean kind of already talked about it, but I'll defer over to Ms. McSheffrey if you want to go ahead and get us started, and then I'll turn it over here. Yeah, so um, uh, I'm, I'm going to start with the advocacy and um, symposium because that was the most recent part that I went to. It was cool because we got training from some lobbyists on um, kind of how to approach our Congress people um, and advocate um, with them. And so they had, NSBA has some talking points that they would like us to talk about, but they said, most importantly, they really, it's really important from them to them to hear from their local constituents and especially um, the impact on children in their district. So I think that um, we did a good job doing that. Mr. Mann, Ms. Carrillo, and I went and um, spoke to three different um, Congress people. Um, and I'll let them uh, talk a little bit more about what, what we advocated for. But some of the things that N NSBA wanted to ad us to advocate for was um, Funding idea at 40%. I learned that we're, it's only funded at 13%, which is really sad. Um, also, um, healthy school meals for all, which we're fortunate that we we will be getting that for our district because, um, because of where we are financially, correct? Um, but that's important for kids nationwide to have that for a variety of reasons. And one thing I learned is that... Um, the nutrition guidelines are so strict that they also do not want those um, being changed anymore. The sodium levels are so low. The um, whole grain is so um, strict that it's really hard to make the food edible. So I appreciate our nutrition team for doing what they can do and um, using their talent to make the food as tasty as they can, um, knowing these challenges. So anything we can do, what we're doing with gardens is a great way to kind of supplement that because that teaches kids the love of um, vegetables and fruits, um, using it with their hands, being able to harvest it. That's that's one of the most fundamental things you can do um, to, to supplement, I think. It was wild to hear about how much food went to waste and how nobody would buy it during COVID. And just because it wasn't something anybody would buy because nobody's going to eat it outside of a school, which is kind of depressing. Yeah, there was a statistic that they even like tested it out on prisoners and they didn't want to eat it. So it's, it you know, we're feeding garbage cans when we make the requirements so strict. Um, we want them to eat healthy, obviously, but if they're not going to eat it, what's the point in doing that? <laughs> yeah. So um, Temple Grandin was one of the um, keynote speakers. I don't know if you know who she is. If, if you don't know anything about her, HBO has a film called Temple Grandin. It was, she referenced it. So she, I think she's a fan. It's a, it's a, a bio, biopic of her. Um, she's a genius um, but she's also on the autism spectrum. She's um, she was a very unique speaker and kind of um, <laughs> off the wall a little bit, but it was really great. And um, she just had some wonderful things to say about you know how people learn differently and the, and the types of things you can do um, to work with people who learn differently. And gosh, they're important to this world because they contribute. Um, uh, to many in many different ways. I have a family full of them, so <laughs> I know. Uh, and it's sometimes really hard to work with people who don't learn the same way that you do. Um, but they're obviously incredibly important to our world, and, and many of them are incredibly brilliant. And she was just amazing. So find the movie if you can, because it's it's really good. Um, there was a presentation on AI, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and Mr. Mann, I may have even written this down wrong, but they said 50% of teachers are all in, 50% are not. I mean, there might, I may have heard that wrong. No, you heard, you heard it right. I think they flubbed their... Okay. Because the normal curve is you have 20% early adopters, 60% who are sort of your nervous people mm -hmm. waiting to see how it pans out, and 20% are who are, pardon the expression, hell no, we won't go, right? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the normal distribution. Mm -hmm. They used like, I think it was like, 
really large numbers that seemed to total to more than a hundred. So I think that yeah. was just an error on yeah. that part. But the concept is, I think, very valid that you've got your folks that are out there running with AI yep. and they may be the ones that are kind of testing the limits of, you know, the tool sets and the, and the systems that we have um, and maybe not maybe ahead of where we're prepared to be. And then you have your folks that are taking that wait and see approach. And then you have your folks who, um, you know, they're, they didn't really like these newfangled computer things to begin with and that AI <laughs> right. thing you know is not happening for them so. right and i can so some of the takeaways i thought were it's kind of like when the internet was introduced which seems mm -hmm. like a million years ago now but um they did say there is no reliable ai predictor so if you think someone is cheating you know there's no way to really tell um so you know, don't panic about about it. I think at the moment, there um, the takeaway was it's kind of about the learning process and not necessarily the end product. Which I think you know that's kind of an internet thing too, and learning you know what are reliable sources. Um, there is an AI for teachers called Diffit. It's free, um, and it just helps. I didn't write all this down, but it helps with, you probably I think, I think it helps with the development of lesson. Plans. That's right. So it, it, yes. auto, it automates a lot of those components, which is kind of near and dear to my heart because many years ago, sorry for this sidebar, I had a startup and one of the concepts behind it was <laughs> why do we build curriculum, but we don't give teachers sample lesson plans. They end up on, you know, what is it? Teachers. Teachers, teachers pay teachers. Pay teachers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so having an AI tool that could help automate some of that, sort of crime mm -hmm. work, I think is a really powerful and useful thing. So so if you're curious, that sounds like a good tool, Diffit, D-I-F-F-I-T. Um, and then just a couple other things. I mean, I went in the equity um, conference, I went to a couple really good SEL um, sessions and, you know, that's overwhelming, obviously. And some districts are getting a lot of pushback on, on the term SEL and also the word equity. But obviously, there are many things that live within SEL that you can use those words instead, or just pick one or two. You know, it's there's hundreds of words that fall within SEL. Um, there was, I'm gonna just read one thing to you. Um, oh, the benefits of SEL, which I think I think we all know this, but I thought this was impressive. 11% point gains in academic achievement. 42% less likely to be involved in physical aggression in schools and an $11 return on investment for every dollar spent on SEL programs, long-term decreases in violent and drug crime convictions and lower and risky and lower risky sexual behaviors and long-term increases in college readiness, career success, positive relationships, better mental health and engaged citizenship. So those are the benefits. So, I appreciate that we have a huge focus on that um, in this district. So um, that was really good. And then lastly, there was somewhere, I just thought this was so cool, um, something called the Dignity Index. That's something you can just Google. It's eight points, and I don't know if I'll find my I have a, a photo. There you go. Thank yeah. you, Jay. Yeah. Yes, I think I've got those at home, and I forgot to bring them here. Yes, I think that's fabulous, and I think it could be a really simple thing for our district to adopt. It's just kind of a, a goal, a way to live life <laughs> and get to number eight, you know? And and they give a set of skills for dignified disagreement. Yes. And I think it would be really powerful for us to integrate that into some of our youth equity stewardship work and, you know, conversations around uh, restorative practices and things like that. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was, that was my favorite takeaway. Yep. So that's all I have. I, but I love that we're agendized for it because sometimes when someone brings something up, it'll trigger my memory. So thank you. Yeah, that way we can have these fluid conversations back and forth. Um, one of the things about that with Ms. McSheffrey is like when you go into the Dignity Index website, the first thing that you see is we believe words have power. So it sets away from that saying that we all learn as kids and we go around saying that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I'm so glad we're staying away from that kind of language because there is power in words and just like a child who is consistently told that they're not good enough or whatever it is, they start adapting to that and learning into it. So words really do have power and that index really teaches us on how to make sure that we're better with our words because kids are 
you know, constant sponges and they're just picking up on what we're putting out there in the universe. So we all need to be very mindful of what we're putting out there and saying. But that was just another takeaway of, of that that I had as well. Can I add on what you just said? Yeah, if anybody, because um, it's a really great metaphor for that. And I love that you brought up like, let's stop using sticks and stones quote. Um, if anybody hasn't, there's videos of them online of teachers doing this, but where they have students crumple up the paper and then talking about when you uncrumple it, you can never get rid of those creases, right? It's the paper will never be the same. Um, and so it's that, that's what words can do. So um, I'm looking forward to learning more about the dignity index. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Ms. Gibson McLean, do you have any other takeaways, any other information, things that you would like to add on? Yeah. So there's a really good um, workshop I went to um, called Creating Schools Where Transgender and Non-Binary Students Thrive. And um, there was a presenter named Rebecca Kling, who um, is the education director at the National Center for Transgender Rights. She had a presentation that basically kind of went through how anybody who works in a school can be help make more inclusive spaces. And so the kind of four phases she went through were educate, affirm, disrupt, include, and disrupt. Um, we did, had a good conversation and, you know, talked about how you don't really need to be an expert in all of this to be an ally. Um, and to help kids feel included and safe um, on our campuses. Um, oh gosh, I'm remembering something I wrote down and it's on a piece of paper and now I don't have it with me. Um, but it was a good statement I'm forgetting. But anyway, there is a book that just came out called The Advocate Educator's Handbook, Creating Schools Where Transgender and Non-Binary Students Thrive. It came out on the 31st. She's one of the authors and the other presenter who wasn't able to make it is the other author. And so I just wanted to put that out there as a resource. There's also an article on, um, kind of an article to go with it on the NSBA website. I thought she had sent me, oh no, she did. If anybody is interested in the slides, I think she did send them. Yes. So, and she also has a resource list that she sent. So I can share that um, with the admin here at the yeah. district as well. Um, I just thought it was very interesting and um, also interesting seeing maps of like legislation in different states and where we're at with all that. Um, yeah. So <laughs> um, anyway, I thought that was a great workshop. I know we were all present for the lunchtime. Um, mm -hmm. Hold on. There was this cool uh, presentation about the nation's largest African-American video oral history archive called The History Makers. And if you go to thehistorymakers.org, uh, it's essentially, I don't know if it's the last 10 or 20, maybe the last 10 years, right? I can't remember how many years um, that they've, uh, this, gosh, I can't even, hold on. She's probably here. Hold on, let me get her name off of this. I'm on the website. <laughs> Noon. Okay. I think it was Janelle was her first Juliana name. Juliana L. Richardson, okay. sorry. Okay, so Juliana um, has been going around the country gathering stories from um, black leaders in all different states and across all kinds of fields from arts to STEM to military music, politics, whatever. And she has gathered all of these in like a digital archive of video and audio recordings to access. Um, they did provide a sample uh, lesson plan, but it sounds like there's a, like a way to subscribe. We already brought it up to obviously Jay and Dr. Dupin about what it could look like if our district got that as a resource because we noticed nobody in Arizona was subscribed even. Maybe we could even try to um, talk to people at ASU about a partnership in, in getting that resource because it seemed like a really great one. Um, and so, yeah, the historymakers.org, I thought that was really cool. And Ms. Gibson McLean, if may, I may add, one of the takeaways from that and why I felt that was so important is that she shared the story when she was in class growing up that she didn't really feel part of her community or didn't feel engaged because the people who were creating that she was learning about light bulbs or, you know, all these different things did not look like her so she felt like she did not have no sense of community so what she started doing is getting even local people where even if it was music or people 
within her district or her neighborhood that started up something that were people of color. So those kids could have some kind of sense of connection instead of historically seeing the same individuals being the, you know, the runners of everything or the makers of whatever it was or the first one invented. So Arizona doesn't really have a reach. And I thought that would be so cool that our students can identify with people kind of, and it, it kind of brought me to that story that we heard about Larry C. Kennedy, you know, we had a hidden gem within this district that nobody knew. So if we work with these kind of organizations like History Makers, I know here in Arizona, um, Chicano Barrio Stories is one that focuses on the Latinx um, leaders of within these communities so kids can actually start seeing people within their own community that they know or their grandparents or their parents know so they can start identifying other than just throwing them, you know, Martin Luther King or Cesar Chavez, which yes, those are big idols in our communities, but in reality, what kind of sense of ownership do we have when it's just this, you know, idol that we haven't met or that hasn't really impacted them on a level at, at them. So that's why History Makers, I think it was really awesome to do, especially because it's really not done here in Arizona and seeing how our kids can start identifying with, you know, other people of color that have been leaders within their community. Lastly, I also enjoyed Temple Grandin's presentation. I thought she was pretty funny. Um, and I think she, I don't know if she's intentionally funny or not. I can't tell. <laughs> um, but either way, I thought she provided some cool accommodations. I wish I remembered them all, but she had lots of suggestions for like simple accommodations that then make you feel dumb that you didn't think of them after the fact. Um, and so I, I wish, I don't know if she has them written down somewhere or like a book, but. <laughs> yeah, well. I took a lot of pictures of her slides so I can share the those with you. The slides were going very fast. Yeah. There was, it was just like yeah. uh, very fast presentation and I was more into laughing and the entertainment but um the one thing that she did harp on a lot I shouldn't say harp focus on a lot was um getting our youth and kids especially who maybe aren't gonna um, be able to pass like structured math classes but have a gift in a certain area like getting our kids back in the trades and so I know that's something that's been taken away especially at high schools because of funding issues i'm just i don't know what's out there or what partners we could get engaged with to have our kids get exposed to those things um at a younger age or here in in k-8 so there's something on my mind after that yeah i think i think there's definitely opportunities for that and one of the examples that i loved because it was so simple was for some dyslexic students if you just put the material on like a lightly colored paper like a light green or a goldenrod or something like that for some reason being on that colored paper versus a white background helps them read it more easily so that that was a good example of what you were sharing that she just kind of gave these tips that it's like wow you know we would have never thought of that but that's so easy i'm recalling there's something about the lights yeah mm -hmm. the flicker mm -hmm. and the light mm -hmm. green yep yeah fluorescents are not good maybe that explains yeah. why i have lamps in my office yeah Shouldn't be a surprise to anyone at this meeting. <laughs> Just one thing I wanted to add about there, if you were finished on, on the history makers, they did interview some students, and I think you kind of touch on this, but you know, they're like, Yeah, all we ever hear about really at school is Martin Luther King, maybe Malcolm X, maybe Fred like Fred, you know, it's like the same handful of people. So it was a it was eye-opening to these kids who are you know, young adults right now. So I think it was really cool. Awesome. Um, I can go last. So Mr. Mann and Dr. Dupin, you guys have the floor to give your perspective. I would normally it. hand it over to Dr. Dupin first, but I'm going to jump in here because I, I have a, I had a really good presentation I attended that led to what I perceive as a very entertaining story that I'm going to share. So the presentation <laughs> was actually by Creighton School District about our equity journey and its pathway to the student outcomes focused governance work that we're doing. And it was our board president, Sophia Carrillo and Dr. Dupin, our assistant superintendent for teaching and learning. And they, abs and I'm not just saying this because I like both of them, they knocked it out of the park. Like the people in the room were so into this presentation. They Honestly, were. it's the most engaged I saw anyone in any presentation, the entire conference. Yeah. And, um, and the thing that taught me that it was super impactful was, you know, I've never been to this conference before, 
Um, this is the first year I've been to Cube in a bunch of places. And after this presentation, every place I went, people were waving at me. They were coming up and talking to me. <laughs> and I'm like, what is going on here? Like, I've achieved real rock star status. And I was feeling like, it's you know, my, well, yeah, I thought, is it the hair? You know, my ego is starting to get really big, which is what I'm known for. And um, and then all of a sudden, somebody pulled me aside and they said, hey, we'd really like to come and tour your district. And I'm like, oh, wow, that would be really cool. That presentation was amazing. And then I'm like, oh, it's not me. They just, they just saw me hanging with the awesome people at the presentation. And so, you know, they were all like excited about what um, President Curio and Dr. Dupin had shared with them. And I just kind of, you know, had a little bit of oversplash from that. So, but I'm in the in crowd finally for the first time <laughs> in like, you know, 50 something years. So, um, so anyway, I apologize for sharing that story that way, but that really was kind of what happened. I'm like, how does everyone here know me? And then I realized that's how deeply engaged people were. It, it had like a profound effect on people. Mm -hmm. We've already had people reach out that they would like to come and visit. They're asking us to send them more, more resources and materials. And it was not, one of the things I really appreciated about the presentation, it wasn't about how awesome we are and how perfect we did everything. Yeah. It was about our challenges in this journey and where we made some progress and where we had some missteps and you know the struggles and the pathway that eventually took us to recognize that the student outcomes focused governance was our best tool set for um, overcoming some of the, the equity challenges that we have within the district. And um, it was it was just really a great presentation. I know I've gone on too long about it, but it was it was so super cool to be there as not as one of the presenters and get to be in the audience and watch and actually participate in some of the group work that was done and see just how engaged everybody was. So, yeah. so that, that was super, super cool. Um, and you know, a lot of the things you heard, I, the other thing I really want to share is going with a group of people, um, people who know me know that probably right after responsibility, my, my top defining Gallup strength is input. So I love just getting new information and tool sets, but I also know I have my own lenses. And so getting to spend time with different team members throughout the stretch of the conference and kind of getting their wisdom and guidance and what they were seeking really like I would have had no idea that Temple Grandin presentation that that was a big deal and then you know Amy shared some background with me and I was like oh you know that sounds really cool I got to make sure I'm sitting in on that right and then I sat there and just it's like that old ad they used to have for one of the speaker sets where the person's face is like all pressed back, you know, by the, I was just blown away by it. It was just amazing. And so, you know, everybody that was traveling together really for me, I want to appreciate them because they helped make the experience that much more rich for me because they helped me step into spaces that I might not have selected for myself. And so being able to use all of your lenses, helped give a much broader perspective to me throughout the, the course of the conference. So, and a lot of super, super actionable stuff. And then the chance to meet with the, um, the aides for the congressional and, and senatorial folks, um, Mark Kelly's office was probably the most welcoming of everybody and just got to give a shout out to them. They, they were truly awesome to work with. Um, and it was, it was really nice to get to, understand a little better what happens on Capitol Hill and how we can connect and have a stronger voice in advocacy for our students and our community. So I um, appreciate the, the board for that. And sorry, Dr. Dupin, I should, probably should have let you go first because it went on too long. <laughs> it was funny during the presentation listening to people be shocked about politics and yeah. what we're not allowed to do in the classroom. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were yeah. like, what? Yeah, when we shared what? some of the politics in Arizona, <laughs> like some people literally fell out of their chairs. Yeah. So. <laughs> Well, and but I just want to second what you said about um, the the presentation that you guys did. I meant to say that in my initial thing. It was really good, and and everything you said is so true, Jay. They were so engaged, and I think it was very brave. I mean, we're being brave to share our goals. We're being brave to have the goals that we made, and they were they were like, wow. And I think they were really impressed with our with our goals and guardrails. I really got that sense um, from them, and I witnessed. Um, Mr. Man's star. <laughs> I think it also, was a phenomenon. Yeah. I think also because the presentation included like 
not shortcomings, but areas for growth. Mm -hmm. um, people were giving like pretty great input on what they think could be improved mm -hmm. or suggestions for things for us to try on. So I thought that was cool too. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I would just add, um, I think one of the big pivots that we made in preparing, we had spent a lot of time in our trainings up to this point as a district talking about being um, creating safe spaces. And so I want to give credit to President Carrillo because she, you know, was kind of sharing some new learning that she's had. And she's like, well, really, it's not safe spaces that we're trying to create. It's brave spaces because being safe can also mean being kind of passive and and sitting back. You know, I'm safe when I'm in my comfort zone, that kind of thing. And so the new language that we introduced was creating brave spaces where people feel not only safe physically, mentally, emotionally, but also empowered to share story, to bring comments, concerns, bring their own experiences. And so we tried to weave that throughout the message and it felt like a really appropriate shift at that time because going in, you know, just speaking from my own experience, going into that space with educators from all over the country, board members from all over the country, um, many of whom were people of color, and talking with them about the work that we had done and putting our goals on display, talking about our, our lack of impact with Black students in particular, our eighth graders in particular, and just being really um, transparent about those areas of focus and the work we feel like we have yet to do uh, was was incredible and a real privilege. So it was it was it was a privilege to represent the district and all the people, all the voices, all the work that got us to where we are. And it was fantastic to present with President Carrillo, who can really, I will say, dazzle a room. Um, was 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 amazing. So. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, um, for mine, I mean, that was huge. It was an honor to be able to present at a national conference and have, you know, school board members and other administrators in the room, you know, to kind of dive in and want to know more. We've gotten so many emails and I know Superintendent um, Mann has some people coming in that are really interested in the work we're doing. So kudos to everybody here, too, because it's really showing forth all the work that we're collectively doing. And um, just to add up a little bit on what Dr. Dupin said about brave spaces, um, you know, it's something that I learned through one of my mentor mentors in this SOFG cohort as well. But at the end of the day, that's what you want to do, right? You want to create as a parent, I think about, do I want my kid to be safe or do I want them to be brave? And to me, um, that safetyness and that braveness, when they're feeling safe, they feel brave. And when you they feel brave, they feel empowered. And that's when kids can really get activated when they feel like they are empowered to do whatever it is that they need to do to provide the outcomes that that we need them to do. So that was really great. Um, one of my biggest takeaways too is always um, just because I have a background in community organizing. I've been community organizing since 2010 um, when SB 1070 first oh. in Arizona. So my favorite part of going to NSBA is having conversations with congressmen about what they really need to get their act together on to better serve the districts. So I'm going to go over three little things that we did. Um, we spoke to them about McKinney-Vento. McKinney-Vento, we've ran historically into the issues, especially with families that get served 72-hour eviction notices. McKinney-Vento doesn't really do anything to help those families until they're actually out on the streets. So we went out and advocated what kind of lenience can you give us as a school district to be a little bit more preventative versus, you know, flighting around last minute what we're going to do with these families that are displaced. So that was one advocacy. Um, we talked about the lunch already. Um, another one that we did was the federal title funds that are going to private schools in our community. Um, we did talk to them about the ESA vouchers um, situation that we're facing here and how that's impacting public schools. And to me, it doesn't make sense if people, if these private schools have an option of obtaining that type of money that's usually tends to be higher than the per diem that we get anyways, um, the ADM. Why are we additionally on top of that, not only giving these private schools funny, but where it's up to the district to follow where that money goes and oversee all that because the students are going into a private school. So that was something that we advocated for too. It's like, hey, with this ESA um, funding 
going on, we should have a little bit more leeway of not giving that money, keeping the money here, and obviously not burdening our staff with kids that are going into the private institutions. So those were a few um, things that we talked about. And like I said, this is always one of my favorite things because they really get to hear from us. Um, we sat with Gallego's office, um, Mark Kelly's office, and Britt Biggs. Um, and Biggs was a really neat one experience just because they had no idea what McKinnevento was. So it was great as a colleague to bring some you know, knowledge to that so they can actually move along with McKinney Vento and try to do something. So that was good. I know, I know. Um, okay, well, that concludes our advocacy and reports. <laughs> in case any, anybody else have anything else to add. All right. I would just say any, because I didn't get to go. So if you guys do have slides or notes or anything, if we can get those, that would be amazing. I just forwarded mine to Hilda and Jay. Thank you. Perfect. And we'll try to make this a regular practice for future conferences as well. Yeah, and I like this better so we can discuss and go back and forth. All right, that brings us to 4A, which is our student outcomes focus governance update. Um, the only update that I have from our end is that we're going to set forth our goals and our guardrails and we're going to talk about them at our next community council meeting that's going to be on february 20 let me pull out my camera just a second i don't want to get wrong info it is yes so it's going to be february 22nd at 6 p.m loma linda school thank you for hosting us um, so make sure that you guys come to the community council meeting. We're going to be presenting the goals, the guardrails, getting feedback from the community. I would love if all there, I see a lot of principals here, so if we can start getting that information sent out to our community and families on take home Tuesdays. I know that's a thing in the district, um, just so we can get as much feedback as we can, because once we adopt this, we don't want to do anything without community input first. And the only update that I'm wondering is if we figured out dates after community council, because what we plan on doing is hitting each school on its own as well for people who cannot come to community council to give families from that specified school one more last opportunity to come and give us feedback on these guardrails and goals. So I'm not sure where that's standing. I'll defer to Mr. Mann. Mr. Carvajal will come up and give us an update. Always put on the spot. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, members of the board and president, uh, executive team. Uh, we are working with principals and the CEOs to put together just a specific uh, topic rather than a secondary or tertiary topic, since this is so important uh, for the community to provide uh, specific feedback on the guardrails and the goals from the board. And so we're putting together all of those dates. I've been in communication with Hilda Juarez about availability, and if it's not the board, who else could, could present, uh, since not everybody has been trained in, in them, and want to make sure that we have uh, clear materials and doubts that help uh, grasp the concepts of the guardrails goals for the members of the community, so their input is more aligned uh, to what you're, you're seeking uh, of. So we're working diligently, and as soon as we have all of the dates, we'll give them to Dr. Um, Mr. Mann and Hilda, so you guys have them in your calendar. And just for, Trent, thank you so much for the update. I appreciate it. And since we have some of the principals here, it's just for transparent reasons. The reason why we're asking for specific dates is that we had one set up at, at Creighton Academy, and it was in combined in conjunction with a high school fair, but we weren't mentioned. And to me, that seemed and that was on our fault. That had nothing to do with the school. We kind of rammed it in there and shame on me because I was like, let's get this out. As I got excited, you know, I was like, ooh, let's do this. And I'm like, wait a minute. Nobody even knows why they're coming. They're thinking they're coming to one thing. So I know it puts a little bit harder work, but for us, it's really, very really important to be able to get information and feedback from the community on these guardrails. So we're just asking for one date, whatever date is, we'll make it work up here that we can have that time and space open to the community so they can come and ask questions and we can have this fluid conversation back and forth and get their feedback. Um, but that's what we're asking for. So sorry in advance, but I am our community 
deserves to be part of this decision making process as well. And as far as those handouts that uh, Mr. Carvajal asked about, we do have the English draft version now, and they are working on getting us the Spanish draft version. So by the, hopefully by the, I shouldn't say hopefully, by the time we have that community council, we will have English and Spanish of the, um, I don't know what to call them, like the infographic sheets that have a little bit more detail um, and uh, information on them. And... Uh, there was oh, and Miss McSheffrey is going to be joining us this Friday, I think, for um, our student. Uh, oh man, words are failing kids, me today. Creighton Kids, kids Congress, Congress. Yeah. and I haven't had a chance to talk to Dr. Dupin about it yet, but I'm hoping we can um, take some time there to go through the outcomes-focused governance with that group because they probably won't meet again before you know, we're kind of in a position to start looking at adopting. So we'll actually be able to get that that student perspective there as well. So I think I think we've got a good lineup of multiple opportunities to engage with students, community, parents, etc. And we should have some better tool sets for you. So you're not just going in with, hi, my name is, and this is what student outcomes focus governance is, you'll you'll actually have some some resources. Awesome. And I was wondering too, because I'll be um, out of town for when most of this happens, which is fine. I just, I'll be curious to hear the feedback, but can we put it out on social media as well? Like, is there a downside to doing that? I think as board members, yeah. we don't want to engage in conversation on social media, like, but yeah. you know, we can get feedback and read it that way. But yeah, we, we, what we can do is we can create like a, you know, a, like a fairly open-ended survey tool and something similar to what we did with community council last time. And then we could go ahead and push a link out to social media with, once we have the, the infographic, the infographic yeah. in both languages, we can push the infographic out there as sort of the, um, you know, impetus mm -hmm. and then give people the link to be able to then provide that, that input that way, if they're unable to make it to any of those other venues. Right. That That'd be have. great. Yeah. yeah. And then I kind of have a follow up. Um, we definitely want the community input. I love that it'll be talked about at Kids Congress. Do we have a plan for getting more teacher voices, like our staff at our schools? We could certainly um, try to find some time. I know the principals out in the audience that can feel their hands. I know principal to principal. I'm up. sorry. <laughs> so because they, you know, they always struggle to have enough time for what for what they have on their docket already. But we'll we'll find a way to make some time. And. Think and just to add to that, I'm, I apologize, but just to add to that, um, I meet with somebody from CA on a regular basis and I'm giving the information to my CA member and hopefully through the union, they can pass out information to teachers. I know that not every teacher is involved in the union, but word of mouth always goes around. No, it does. I was just thinking in terms of, you know, even if it's just like that we could prepare something that the principals felt confident, at least giving the background at, you know, a Wednesday staff meeting. Um, because not not all teachers, not all educators are going to hear from CEA. Not all of them are gonna watch the board meetings. Not all of them are gonna come to community council. So we just wanna make sure when we're talking about making sure everyone's on the same page, the adults that are working in our schools, we we want to make sure that they're informed too, so. Yep, and, and we can minimize the time impact by providing copies of the infographic yeah. and then perhaps a link to to a similar survey tool. That's what I was thinking. That not way. like a two hour right. like not, PD yeah, by any means. Not a 45 just minute drag through the guardrails. Sure yeah. yeah. Well, you, you have, yeah. I was just and we can say. push it out via the Crane yeah, Connection that's, well. That would be a great place to put it. We're actually yeah. filling up Emily's to-do list tonight, so. It's yeah, good. I keep hearing like a weird audio. I know. Is there like somebody that is like unmuted? I believe we have um, someone who's part of an upcoming item that's oh. on line for us and may, may be slipping up there. We're currently both muted, but that may not be too much. Okay. Fair enough. Cool. We just want to make sure we weren't going crazy. Um. <laughs> so, Mike, I just have a really quick question. So, um, when those dates are set for those sites, um, can we get that information? Um, and hopefully some of them are in the evening. Um, I'm just going to say right now, I can't come on the 22nd. <coughs> My kids are going to be singing at Gamage. Um, oh, cute. Yeah. So um, usually I'm really good at those things, but I won't be at that one. But I'll try to come to other ones if, if I know ahead of time. 
Yeah, and definitely Perfect. like if any of the at school events, if there's any like first thing in the morning or end of the day, it's more likely I can come. <laughs> but I'll Perfect. try to be as many as I can. Perfect. Um, any other comments, questions on SOFG? And once we get this settled in and we start talking about, we'll talk about next steps too, because we have some other coaching that we have to do with Dr. Ramos. Um, and on that note, um, I started the SOFG cohort as well for implementations. I will be in Kentucky this Thursday, um, getting in-person professional development on this, and it's a nine-month course, so it is very rigorous, and I have to do homework assignments. I'm just like, what did I sign myself up for? But here we are. Um, so I'm really excited for that, and Give, bring back what I'm going to be learning out there for the SOFG framework. Okay. So, oh, yes, I did deliver those to Ms. Juarez. Okay, so yes, we have copies of the book and we got one for each board member and cabinet as well, um, whoever wants to start reading it. Great on their behalf if anybody else wants to know what book we're talking about, which talks about all this SOFG framework. Okay, that brings us to our next item, which is 5A public comments. I don't see any regular public comment cards, so I'll save the rest for when the items come up. And that brings us to six, which is approval of consent. I move the governing board approve consent. Can we just pull a, what's the, the first one? A? Yeah. A. Okay. Move the governing board approve consent agenda items B through G in accordance with policy BEDB-E. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And Ms. Gibson-McLean, you have the floor for item 6A. I just thought it would be remiss to like let us just continue and vote on that without giving a thank you and a shout out to Pam Burkhart for 47 years of service in this district. That is a long time. Um, and a lot of work and energy and service that she's given to our, our youth and our community. So thank you so much, Pam. I want to second that because she is amazing. And like, there's just not even anything to describe the quantity and complexity of everything she has done in this district. And she is listening, by the way. Oh. Yay. Thank you, Pam. Uh, thank you, Pam. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, and with that, I move the governing board approve consent agenda item A in accordance with policy BEDB E. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, that brings us to 7A insights and actions from the Equimetrics survey. Thank you, Madam President, members of the governing board and executive team. As you know, the Creighton School District uses several different types of metrics to capture data on, on satisfaction and progress, particularly around health, wellness, and our equity work. This year, we added a tool set called Equimetrics to that mix for the very first time. And so this evening, we have a couple of experts who are going to join us virtually to explain uh, the way that Equimetrics works and to share some of the highlights of the data. And then we are working on figuring out how best to take action um, considering the information that we've received so far. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Del Johnson and Joe Bird. Hopefully you can hear us and see us and we're ready to roll. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Very happy to hear be with you tonight, Creighton ISD. Can you hear us? Yes, yes we, we can, can hear you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you. We can hear you perfectly. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Excellent. Well, thank you again for, for having us. Uh, Mr. Mann and team have gone through this information, so we're just going to share with you a, a high-level overview so you can see what um, the Equimetrics process looked like, uh, what we you know what data came out of that from the response throughout the district. Um, and, uh, if, if, and again, I'm not sure how much time we have, so if there's time for questions, um, we can do that or... We can certainly address those at another time as well. So, awesome! Thank you. So we will jump in here. So again, we just want to walk through with you the, some of the survey details. I will talk about what the overall score means, um, what the actual overall score was, 
Um, and then, of course, we'll get into the specific areas of focus. Um, there's going to be some, uh, you know, items that were higher and lower on the on the scale, um, as well as comments, the things that came out the most or were mentioned the most in, in terms of comments um, and some observations and recommendations based on that. Um, so, again, just to um, just, you know, real quickly, uh, this fall, uh, the survey was launched to all district, uh, all district employees, uh, all staff. So it would have been about 720 people that uh, were sent an email um, and they were able to respond in these particular areas. And so I, we don't put this up here so that, you know, you can absorb all of this right now. I just wanted to kind of share with you the overview of what we covered. So the first four areas are going to be more about experience. So diversity, equity, inclusion, cultural competency. Um, how are people experiencing things here in Creighton ISD? Um, and then when you look at uh, mission, vision, and values, uh, communication, leadership, alignment, and policy and practice, we're looking more at the structure, right? What's the structure that's in place? What do we have um, in our plan? How is it being communicated? How are leaders um, taking ownership and, and sharing the plan? Um, and just what's, you know, what's in place now? So um, we, we do have scores. Um, a cumulative score with all of that and we also have scores in each of those areas so you can take a closer look at um you know which areas are relative strengths which areas are relative you know areas of opportunity um you know and of course what the priorities would be in terms of um you know what you'd want to focus on going forward so that's what we measured um, here's how we measured it so uh employees that received the survey um, each statement they read, um, they would rate it a one if they strongly disagreed with that statement. No, we're not doing that. We're not seeing that at all. Um, Ten if they strongly agreed with that statement. Um, and of course, there's you know responses everywhere in between. Um, but what we're really doing on our on our scoring system is zeroing in on the nines and tens. So the the score uh, is a percentage of the nine and ten responses um, across the whole across the whole district. And I'll call attention here to the uh, the, the rigidity of the scale. Um, the nine and ten is uh, it's, a, it's a high bar, right? It's definitely a, a challenge to get everyone on board to be able to say, "Yep, we're definitely you know strongly agreeing with this statement." Um, you know, but when you think about it in terms of uh, you know promotion, sharing uh, of a plan, uh, getting all people on board with a, with a solitary plan, um, you know, you really need people to be. Um, strongly understanding, uh, strongly agreeing, uh, and really being able to carry that forward. So um, if you think about the net promoter score, if you're familiar with that, it's often used in like marketing or, um, you know, other, you know, kind of community um, branding um, exercises. Um, your nines and tens are going to be your promoters, right? They're the people that um, are on board. They know it. They love it. They're going to share and get others to do the same. Um, your sevens and eights um, are actually uh, neutral. Or, or passive. Um, and so while it's not a bad score to see a seven or eight on a, on a scale of one to 10, um, you know, those are folks that are actually going to be um, a little bit more, uh, you know, not not quite on the fence, but, um, you know, having a, an okay experience. And then so that's, we, you know, we use the example of a restaurant review, right? If you just have an okay experience, you're, you're not very likely to go out and, uh, you know, tell all your friends to, you know, hey, you really need to go have this okay experience too. Uh, I really want you to have that. <laughs> Like I did, um, and then of course you're you're obviously as you go further down the scale you're getting a little bit more negative, um, but your six is down to ones. Um, those would be considered your detractors. So those folks, um, you know, in the in the branding, marketing, kind of evangelical sense, those folks would would be the negative reviews, right? They would be bringing out um, not just you know I didn't have a great time, but here's why um, this is a place that I you know I wouldn't recommend. Um, so. Again, your nines and tens are really what we're focusing on. Um, there's a, a little bit of color coding that you'll see throughout the uh, throughout these slides. Um, what we're showing here is just the three kind of segments. Um, below 35 um, is going to be our red. So anytime you see that color, it just means that the percentage of responses is below 35 and that nine and 10 are strongly agree. Um, somewhere between 35 and 65, it's going to be this yellow group. Uh, and then green would be above 65. So that's kind of the, the goal for, for any of the areas of focus. So our first piece of data is actually our response rate. So we did have, um, again, 720 emails went out. Um, 474 uh, people um, responded and completed the entire survey. 
um, for a percentage of 65.8%. So about two thirds of, uh, of voices were you know, heard. People volunteered to share their information and um, give suggestions and kind of you know, let people know, let leadership know kind of where we're at right now. So that's definitely a good thing. Just to, to give you a, a sense, our right now our um, our overall kind of average response is, is between 65 and 70 percent. Um, so we really shoot for that 70 or above. Um, we do, of course have organizations that don't get nearly this much, but um, you know the, this is definitely a good number to be able to take. The closer we get to 100, obviously, the more we can take that as you know a census. Um, but in this case, you know we're not trying to take a really small group and and you know project outward. Um, this is actually a really good sample size to, to be able to see what people are are saying and, and what they're experiencing. So without further ado, here's our overall score. 37.6. And so again, what that's what that's showing us is that throughout the whole survey, um, all respondents, all focus areas, all items, 37.6% um, of those responses are in that nine and 10 are strongly agree. And if you go over to the middle here, you can see the, you know, the large bar here. Um, we're just over that line, so we're up into that yellow category. So between 35 and 65, um, obviously, you know, good to not be down in the red. Um, fairly, uh, you know, fairly difficult, especially in early on, to be anywhere near that green bar, green box, um, above 65. So while we, you know, put that up there, it's 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 more, it's definitely more aspirational. Um, but we do see um, organizations continue to move up as they. Uh, focus on these specific areas. So, um, and as we continue over to the right hand side of the slide, you can see um, our overall K 12 score right now um, is 29.1. So, from a uh, comparison, um, obviously, um, you know, Creighton, you're, you know, you're, you're doing better than the, better than the average. And as we get another layer into um, the responses, we can now see um, at the top here, we've got our distribution. So thinking about our, you know, our scale showing the nines and tens, the sevens and eights, and the uh, one to six responses, um, you know, as you can see, it's about, you know, a third, a third, a third, a um, couple of things about that. Obviously 37.6% in that nine and 10, um, another 31.5% though are in that seven and eight, right? So they're on the right side of the scale. Right, they're on the side of scale that you want them to be on. The question would be, how would we get, you know, this third? How would we get them to start to scoot more toward this strongly agree? What would things have to look like? And then, of course, we want to get this number as, as small as possible as we as we go. And then over on our left hand side, you can see our our focus areas. So each of these areas has anywhere from two to four specific items that are the statements that we talked about, where people are responding to that statement. Um, and then this just shows you the percentage of strongly agrees in that particular area. So inclusion being our highest, um, down to communication being our lowest. And on the right is, is just more of a visual, um, you know, zero being in the center. So if they were all zero, we do just have a dot. Um, if they were all 100, we'd have a nice big round wheel. Um, what's really interesting as we go um, year over year with organizations, uh, both, you know, obviously K-12 organizations, but also higher education, uh, corporate America, um, law enforcement, um, we actually see that this pattern is, is fairly um, indicative of your culture. So as, as we move these things out year by year, um, the shape actually does tend to stay fairly similar. So while we can really focus on communication, say we want to really work on that and get that way up, as that goes up, um, so do all the other areas of focus. So um, we we may always see that communication uh, gravitates toward that bottom, uh, but but of course we can keep you know keep improving that communication and moving that up. Um, absolutely. And then looking at it a little bit, we actually the next next couple slides are are, are more um, <laughs> not that we've you know delivered bad news, but this is you know really good news as you look at the next couple slides because number one, um, again as we expand out that scale, the nines and tens, you know it's again it's it's a tough bar, it's a high bar, um, but if you include the sevens and eights together with the nines and tens, um, as you can see, you've got quite 
a bit higher uh, number here. So, you know, almost three quarters of the district um, is strongly agreeing on the leadership items. You know, not too far behind inclusion, diversity, um, policy and practice, mission, vision and values. So again, um, in that kind of middle group as far as nines and tens, but if you add the sevens and eights to that, now we're up into that green green area and everything except communication. So that's that's kind of that good news where again, this this group of folks is um, is there. How do we help them kind of ease into that nine and 10 strongly agree? And the next bit of, uh, I guess, good news for you, um, not so not so great news for, for other districts that we work with, but um, this is just the side-by-side the -side comparison when you think about um, not just the overall score, but um, each particular focus area. Um, you can see that there's definitely, uh, you're definitely, uh, definitely winning that competition here in, in all areas, except the communication. It looks like communication on the, um, on the average has been just slightly higher. Um, but again, that's moved up over the, over time as well. So it's good to see how that compares. And if we get one more layer into the data, you can see the particular items uh, that we that, that we had employees respond to. So um, diversity, um, we had you know these are the top four. So again, what we're looking at is the um, high the percentage of um, nine and ten responses. These are the four that were the highest across the whole survey. So we had you know, again one of our diversity items, one of our leadership items, one of our inclusion items, and one of our policy and practice items. And so this is a place, this is actually a kind of an excerpt from um, the snapshot report, which is going to show each and every item in this way. So you can kind of look and see, again, this is what, this is what people responded to. Um, we, you know, hopefully these are actionable as far as when you, you know, read that, you say, yeah, I'd, I would hope that everyone saw that and strongly agreed with it. Um, if the number is not as high as we want it to be, um, what are some steps we can take to make sure that we're, you know, that we're moving that direction. Were participants required to answer all of the questions or could they skip some? Um, they, we only had completed, uh, completed surveys. So yeah, they, the, the, the data we're looking at now is, is all responses. Everyone responded to the whole survey. Okay. Thank you. Wow. So these are our top four on, if we flip that scale over and look at the, um, we'll call it the bottom four, but it's actually the uh, highest percentage of one to six responses. Um, so as, as you can see, two of our communication items, one of our cultural competency items, and one of our diversity items, which is interesting to see. We had one of our diversity items in the top, actually the top, uh, and then we had one of our diversity items um, toward the bottom. That's definitely something to, something to think about. And in each of the focus areas, there was a place for comments. So employees would, um, you know, make their selection one to ten, and then they had a chance to offer some commentary on um, that particular focus area. And so these are um, the co the topics that came out the most. We saw the most kind of cluster around each of these topics, where the most comments were were shared in that particular area. So, um, you know, again, we were able to to pull those out. We do have, uh, we have sentiment scores. Uh, we have summaries of each of the focus areas. We have summaries around each of these topics. There's a lot of information. Again, that's why um, tonight, um, you know, we really just wanted to make sure you've got a high level understanding of, of what the overall data looks like. Um, hopefully this even would be enough to take a look at what some of the priorities might be. Um, and again, we, you know, we had a good, good conversation with, with Mr. Mann and leadership team to be able to um, go a little bit deeper on this and take a look at, um, we have also data by demographic. So, um, you know, location, um, you know, job type division, um, some folks were able to select, um, uh, with prefer not to answer, of course, but they were able to select some more personal identifiers as well. So race, ethnicity, gender, um, sexual orientation, um, disability, things like that. So, um, some of it might, 
you know, some of it as we as we talk through, some of it may be relevant to, um, you know, specific action in those areas. Others, you know, it's just showing that there's not a not a real difference in how people are responding based on these particular identifiers. Um, so again, more more from the team on that. But um, again, these are some of the areas that that came out the most. Um, again, not to <laughs> try to make everybody uh, absorb all these right now. Just wanted to make sure that some of those key terms were. Were highlighted because we did get a lot of really good, uh, really good feedback, really good insight. People really did want to share um, their experiences. Um, you had examples of what's working well. You had examples of of things that are uh, are challenges. Uh, and so that's one of the recommendations that we would um, really kind of put forth is um, you know make sure that you're you know using some of these terms, you know, using this language as you are. Um, sharing results outward and letting people know, um, you know, first of all, thanks for providing your feedback. Um, you know, people took took time to, to share their not only re, you know, the responses, but you know, to um, you know put the comments in and really make sure that their uh, voices are heard. So um, definitely good to see. And, and again, that speaks well to the response rate as well. You're obviously doing some good things to you know have people um, that are invested and, and, and care to participate and, and really want to make things as, as good as they possibly can make them here at, uh, at Creighton. So um, definitely good to see that. Um, and then just, you know, again, some of the observations, you know, obviously mission, vision, and values being one of the higher areas. Um, what that's showing us is that um, there is a connection, right? People are seeing the connection between the policy that we put forth um, and the actions that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, as far as, you know, again, just directly policy and practice, they're seeing that it's there, right? They're seeing that it's going to um, move things in the direction that, um, you know, that we're trying to move it in. Um, and then as far as alignment goes, again, we see some organizations that have great plans. Um, and then, you know, it's really hard to get that into action, right? You've, you've got, this is what's written down, but, um, you know, whether it's, we're, we're too busy or, you know, resources, whatever it is, you know, we don't seem to be um, taking the actions that we've put on paper. Um, so definitely good to see that that's one of the higher ones. People are saying, yes, we have that connection between those things. Um, as far as communication goes, um, we are, uh, again, even, even seeing that in, in the bottom, um, there are some things that, that are indicative of, of communication being a strength for you because when you look at the comments, when you look at some of the relationships between the scales, um, you can actually see that um, the plan is getting out there. Um, a lot of times what happens though, is the second half of the, um, how, you know, we know what we're supposed to be doing, but how are we doing on this today, right? Are we, are we almost there? Are we doing well? Are we, you know, is it terrible? Do we really need to change what we're doing? Um, so continuing to um, kind of keep that cycle going of, of we're going to share out what we're, what our goals are, what we're trying to do. Um, but we're also going to make sure we keep letting people know, you know where they are succeeding, where those successes are happening and um, what people can continue to do to make sure that that keeps, keeps going. And as far as leadership goes, obviously um, it, it, it begins and ends with leaders. Um, the more you can, um, you know, have that ownership, uh, the more people can see that leaders care and, and really want to keep things going the right direction. Um, and then over time, developing more um, informal leaders, right? People taking ownership and taking leadership in, in these areas, um, whether they have a title of supervisor or, you know, administrator or not. Um, there's a lot of folks that have been here for <laughs> many years and, and have done a lot of good things and um, they've got so much knowledge to share. Um, so if you can help those folks buy in and and really make sure that, you know, they're um, sharing with others, um, that's going to be really helpful as well. Um, so as we mentioned, as far as, uh, you know, recommendations go, um, the leadership team has this information. Uh, you know, you've, I'm assuming already had some really good conversations around that. Um, we'd love to continue to, to be part of that dialogue just to make sure that we understand the steps you're taking. Um, you know, if there's other clarifications we can, we can help with, um, we want to make sure that that's part of the process and then also, um, correlation. So, 
we have seen organizations, uh, we, we actually have two survey tools. Orgometrics is our other tool and that focuses on organizational alignment um, to mission, vision, and strategic plan. And then of course, Equimetrics that, you know, that we're looking at here now. Um, we've seen correlation between particular focus areas and other things that are happening throughout the district. So for example, uh, we have districts that, that connect, um, you know, they have different um, pillars uh, in their plans. And among those pillars are going to be specific, you know, uh, whether it's a survey that's in the community, uh, you know, a, a teacher uh, evaluation number, uh, even student data. Um, we would we just would love to know and understand from a, you know, month to month, year to year, um, where some of those connections are. Uh, and so, you know, when our inclusion number is X, um, you know, what is our, um, you know, discipline number look like, or what is our turnover number look or retention number look like. Um, and so, um, again, just over time, that's definitely something that we'd want to recommend you continue to think about. Um, and if there's ways that we can help with that process um, on the data side, or even just the organization of like what we think might be uh, connected, um, that's, you know, we love to do that. And, and, you know, obviously, the more, more we can establish those connections, uh, the more not only can you be focused on doing the things that are going to make an impact, um, but as you're getting more people on board to be able to show them um, this is what this is the impact your action is having. Um, that, again, goes a long way to getting more and more people to, to really buy in and, and make sure that they're taking their part and, and running with it. So that would conclude what we have to share this evening. Um, Mr. Mann, I wasn't sure if you wanted to say anything uh around this or if there's questions or yeah i first off i'd like to share um how much we appreciate the opportunity to work with with dell and, and joe and the team and we feel like we're not just getting survey data back we're getting actionable information that will put us in a position to work to improve um you know how our how our employee experience is with relation to equity um Fascinated and interest, interested as well in the orgometrics, especially as we move into this SOFG work. So we'll probably have some conversations around that um, and see where, where there may or may not be a fit um, moving forward. Um, and then I know there's some other tool sets that we'll be having conversations about uh, through some of the partnerships that uh, Infinity Systems has, where they can even get us some additional actionable information actionable information back. I also want to, um, he's a very good friend, so I'm not gonna share which district, but we have a, uh, I'll call it a sibling district right next door who also participated in the same process. And um, it was very interesting being able to compare and contrast our data you know, with, with that other district. We saw a lot of similarity you know, and a few differences here and there. So I'm, one of my hopes is we may be able to leverage some of our partnerships with other districts to maybe even work together and go in together on some of this work um, because we have those strong relationships. And, um, and then the last piece I will add, because it ties into our conversation earlier about the, um, the equity conference, is that unbeknownst to me, apparently, Dell's nephew was in the audience at the presentation. <laughs> and so when we gave a shout out to Infinity Systems, he pulled me aside and said, hey, I was there. And I just want you to know we were watching you and you you did the right thing and gave that shout out. So, uh, <laughs> so we were, you know, you never know who's watching wherever you are. Um, and so that was actually kind of nice that, that they saw that we were making that correlation about the benefits as well, you know, as part of our presentation. So um, with that, if the board has any questions, you know, we're, we're happy to engage in more dialogue with this as we move forward. Um, one of our, our two challenges in moving forward is figuring out next steps and really taking some opportunity to digest the data even more to figure out wh where is our lowest hanging fruit and what things can we act on um, quickly and efficiently while we're juggling, you know, all of the other balls. At the same time, you heard Joe talk about how some districts, either because of lack of resources or lack of time, they do the survey, but they don't necessarily close the gaps on anything. And we really don't want to put the effort into surveying and not close the gaps. I had an opportunity at a, at a prior district years ago to work with some folks from the WP Carey School at ASU. 
and we were working on customer service. And one of the things I learned from working with them is the only thing worse than not asking people what their experience is, is asking them and then not doing anything about mm -hmm. it. So. That's right. I know some people who could be listening right now. Hello? They should be. People who should be listening. <laughs> Am I one of those? No, people? my boss. Oh, okay. really <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, thank you for that, board members. Do we have any comments or questions? I'll defer my questions and comments till the end. Yeah, I may have missed this part, but when was this survey conducted? October. Okay. It would have been. October 2023. Okay. Um, I mean, I think this feedback is really important and I agree with everything you've said. We've got to share it back. And I think, you know, we could even again in, in the internal newsletter, you know, I know we've been doing this, but, um, and poor Emily, I don't know if she's in here anymore, but you know, I've worked in the communi corporate communications yeah. world my whole life. So, um, the, there's always room to improve and you're always yeah. going to hear complaints about not getting enough communication. So that's, um, that's just a fact, but I think with us that goes hand in hand with transparency too, which right. is something we're all working on improving. Mm -hmm. So I think since that one is like our lowest one, I would think we could do a, when we, when we share this back out, you know, how can we improve communication with yeah. you? What does that mean to you? You know, does that mean, try work continue the work on being more transparent or what does that mean to you and just an open-ended question you might get some some more feedback but i think definitely we need to circle back um, can, can i jump in on that real quick before you move on so one of the things i noticed as we drilled down into the question sets and i wish emily was still here because you know it's you immediately see communication your title has communication and you and you so you own it right and 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 she's a very empathic person and so you know that it's got to be hard to see. When when I looked at the drill down on the questions that Joe shared with us, what I found very interesting is they weren't low scores in relation to things like, are we doing big, you know, is the social media pushing it out there? Is is the, you know, do we have a strong newsletter presence? Are we getting sort of this broad information out? It What it looked like to me, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Joe and Dell, it was a lot of loop closing about within small work groups, like the smaller groups within our organization, what that what those equity issues look like in those groups. And one of the nice things about the way the survey is structured, even though some of it was voluntary, um, because we gave the opportunity for people to identify their work groups, we should be able to drill in like are there is this across all work groups and we've got some big work to do across the board or are we being you know disproportionately affected by a handful of pockets where where this isn't happening and in any organization there's always you know those sectors that are that are more challenging than others we've got those groups of employees that don't regularly get into email we've got those groups of employees that have very limited work schedules so you know and i'm not saying that's where it is we need to do more deep dives to determine that but i think you know to, kind of to the point of and i appreciate your sensitivity for emily having worked in the field <laughs> i don't think you know none of this is saying we have an emily problem but what it is saying is that we have some areas in our district that need her amazing touch to help them be able to communicate more effectively within within those groups. And where we've where we've seen her be very effective is in help not only getting the big message out, but in helping other groups within the district do a better job of internal communication. And we just need to figure out where we need her to drill down and help some of those other groups accomplish that in relation to the equity work. So I don't, it, that doesn't need to be right. So Del and Joe, if I'm wrong, please, please correct me and, and set me on the straight and narrow here. No, that's absolutely right. I was going to mention, um, you know, we've had the, the conversation, you know, hundreds of times where, you know, the, the communications person says, whoa, this is, <laughs> uh oh. Um, but, but no, it, it, like you said, when you drill down into the individual items, we're really asking specifically about diversity, equity, inclusion, and the plans, the, you know, the process, the, you know, how leaders are doing with that. Um, so it's really specific to this subject matter. It's not how is our general communication. Um, and so a that you're spot on, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's really specifically focused on 
um, this subject matter, but then also, um, and you, you mentioned this, the, the demographic information is a good way to really break that out to say, okay, do we have, you know, a similar score across the board? Do we have certain pockets that are, you know, scoring higher in communication? Do we have certain pockets that are scoring lower in communication? Um, and then the, you know, the, obviously, you know, what work do we need to do in each of those areas? But then I would also add um, putting some of those specifics in there, um, not only on, you know, where we are right now with these things, but, um, you know, what, what people can do to continue to drive that forward. Um, as people see, um, you know, sometimes communication is not just, you know, we need to tell you what the plan is. Um, oftentimes it's this specific action that this person did really helped us with this part of the plan or this, you know, the, this behavior, this action, this, this way of, you know, way of, uh, you know, moving through the district is something we need to see more of. And so kudos to, to this person for doing this, but, um, it doesn't just mean they're a great person. It means that they're doing this particular thing that helps our this part of our plan. So really connecting connecting those actions um, with examples um, just to refine the communication. Right? It's not just we need more communication. It's we need to make sure that uh, we're continuing to refine and and share the the specifics that are going to help us move forward. Oh, nice. and, then, and then kind of as you spoke about trying to identify some low hanging fruit. I think right there could be an opportunity to weave that right in and get started. And then also Mr. Mann was talking about the importance of uh, neighboring districts or benchmarking and things like that. The Arizona ecosystem continues to expand. Districts like the Isaacs district have taken part now, and I've got a few others that are going to be joining real soon here as well. So we'll be able to compare you to others and Obviously, we can redact the names, but you'll still get the, the number comparison to see where things are. Excellent. Thank you. No, and I just one last thing on the communication. I appreciate um, you bringing it up and I appreciate the clarification because that is really common to say, oh, we're struggling with communication. And then people just inundate with more <laughs> and not the right kind. And that can actually have a negative effect. So. Yeah, I mean, that all sounds right to me. Yeah, and I think just one other comment, the most common topics page, this data review, I mean, these are all things I've been hearing for the past decade. <laughs> uh, and unconscious bias jumps out at me because I remember Carla Rivera Cruz brought that up and, you know, maybe it wasn't presented in the ideal way, but man, woo, it got shut down. Um, people were so offended by that term. Um, and I'm just glad that we're bringing it back up again because it exists in every human being and it's not something to be embarrassed about. It's something we need to talk about. I think this Eesh. is great. That's like uh, 15 years ago. We should have been there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. McSheffrey. Any other comments or questions? Ms. Ayers? Yeah. So, it was this has this data been shared back with like employees it, it is not yet we brought it here so uh -huh. executive team reviewed it first um we did give a little bit we were a little bit out of sequence because we were part of a presentation at the asba winter conference with some of the preliminary data so that went out publicly ahead which would not normally be our practice but it was shared with executive team um recently we got more of the data a couple of weeks ago um, and then we wanted to bring it to the board before we pushed it out to all of the staff mm -hmm. and so um, you know it's one of, one of the things we're trying to create as a common practice is making sure that not only are we providing this information to the board but where possible you know we really want to do it in a public forum you'll see that later this evening you know when, when we share some information about the ESSER plan and you know some of the budget issues that that our team will share with you um, in past years you know i think a lot of that's been handled in executive session and there's really no reason for it to be behind closed doors if it's information it's information and there's really no reason it it, it can't be public so um so we're you know uh 
I don't know if it was Ms. McSheffrey or someone else mentioned earlier that transparency challenge. You know, the goal is really to kind of take all the curtains off. That will create growing pains because people, you know, are not used to it. And so there'll be all sorts of accusations about, well, why, you know, why are we talking about this with the board? Why is this in public? But the reality is until we get better about building our common practice as being able to talk about things in public openly and making it available to everyone, um, we're, we're not going to get away from those challenges that create that are created by those blinders of things happening sort of in the back room, you know, away from away from that public view. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a great point. I, I bring it up because as a teacher in Isaac, I did take this um, Equimetrics. So um, I'm familiar with the kind of questions that were asked. <laughs> I'm also like one of those people that want to see the data back. And um, I know that we probably won't right at the moment, but I think it's important as a, as a staff member and a teacher that has taken this, that we do get the results back. Yep. Um, and I think it's a topic of conversation because I just, I know that after we took it, um, there was conversation that was had like amongst the teachers um, already. And so I just think it's important for that transparency, like we've been talking about. And just some people just want to know data, yeah. like especially when we talk about so like communication sometimes is so subjective because some people seek that communication and they want to understand what's going on. And some people could kind of care less. They are those people that don't check their email or they are those people that just like go with the flow every day. I'm one of those people that want to know all of the data. Yeah. Um, and so I really like that, that you brought this to us. Um, but I do, I would like to see it brought back to the staff as well. Absolutely. And, th and that's been our, atten our intention all along. I think the point I was trying to make earlier is that when we share it back, like it's not an uncommon practice for us to go, we took a survey, uh -huh. we got the data, here right. you go board, here you go public, here you go staff, we're going to throw it in the connection. Mm -hmm. And then that's the, that, that feels sometimes to leadership like we've closed the loop. We took the survey and we've told everybody about it, but that's not the end of the story. Right. The end of the story is what actions will we be taking in order to make improvements based on the feedback we've mm -hmm. received. So we, right. we will put the data out there in its raw format, which may create some consternation, mm -hmm. but we will then follow up on that with what did this data tell us and what will we be doing to try to create improvement? And then the gold seal standard from my perspective is for us to then come back again and share, we committed to doing these things because of this data we received here's what was done right so just kind of that to me that's the final closure of the loop but it's not a loop it's one loop in a chain and then the chain continues when we do follow-up survey work to see what are our results now and and i would warn the board and our community and our and our staff to not be shocked if we see an implementation dip going from first survey to second survey, because the other thing that the survey work does is it gets people thinking about these concepts. And when we share the results out, it gets them thinking more deeply about it. And when we share what we're doing to make improvements, it gets them thinking more deeply about it. So the second time they take this survey, and I don't know if, if Joe and Dell have any experience with this happening with other districts, clearly this is our first go around, but my expectation would be our staff become more informed consumers of the survey and as more informed consumers they are going to be harsher critics than they may have been the first go around and i will add they mentioned that at the equity conference that that does indeed happen with sel stuff too once people are more um, educated about what it is they're being asked about then they're like oh actually we're not doing it that good of a job now that i know what you're asking me. i thought we were great but i didn't know yeah. it should be like this right yeah exactly yeah. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's as simple as, you know, you've now stated, you've stated the goal. So you've said, you've told everyone, here's the expectation, here's what we want to be doing. Um, and so if they've seen that, and then, you know, we're, we're just kind of waiting for that result to come. Um, it can be a, an opportunity to, to rate it a little bit more harshly. You're right.
Well, and I think especially when like knowing communication is one of our harder pieces and, and we need the specifics on what, you know, and how, um, but with that too, like some of the, the steps we're taking, everything with SOFG, you know, nothing happens overnight. Um, and I think some of what we saw was, you know, oh, our, our strengths are that people know there's a plan, right? Mm -hmm. But they are going to be looking for, as you said, Joe, the results, right? And so it just becomes that much more important when we talk about our benchmarks and those, you know, just like we progress monitor our kids, right? We're not going to see it all overnight but are we at least meeting those benchmarks and how are we communicating that out? Um, because people want to see progress, right? Um, and I, I just really appreciate, I appreciate how in-depth this is. Um, I'm excited we're doing this and I appreciate everything you shared about, you know, just doubling down because as an educator, I have taken culture climate surveys every year for all the years I've been in education and I have yet to see anything done with them. Um, so I just really appreciate the intentionality behind this and um, just want to publicly say like we're holding all of us accountable to actually doing that. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have a question. I don't know if this is for Joe or Del and forgive me for talking to you by on a first name basis, but I can't no read. Problem. I can't say last names. Um, just so I understand and correctly, um, Ms. Potters, are you able to bring up page 19 again where it has the Equimetrics data review and comments? I don't know if you're able to pull it up here, but if not, on these com I'll think Joe could do it. Okay. On these comment topics, these are specific comments from the employees <laughs> based on the peer to peer interaction, right? As an yeah. employee of the institution, I just want to make sure that I have this understood correctly yep so yeah this would be um this this would be the most common terminology that people used in the comments talking about those specific areas in there so yeah it's, it's, it's i mean some are going to be specific to and right this. other ones okay and the only reason why i asked that is because and thank you for that clarification, is because I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the homophobia, the racism, and the ableism. One of the things that we just learned in this SOFG framework is that student outcomes will not change until adult behaviors change. And if our adults in this institution are acting this way, no wonder our kids are behaving in the classrooms, targeting each other, calling themselves names, and not respecting each other. So one of the big culture changes with this SOFG framework is that we're going to hold the adults in this institution accountable too. And the fact that we haven't really moved on to see who's experiencing this homophobia or racism is a little alarming to me because I want my staff to feel brave in their environment too. And if our staff are not feeling brave, then it's not going to trickle down and we sure as heck are not going to have brave students in the classrooms. So my ask after receiving this data and looking at it is, I don't know if in a future board update, I'm not going to put a time frame, but I would really like to see what we're doing about these specific comments. And it's repeated on here multiple times. And for me, for one staff to feel unsafe because they feel like somebody's being homophobic against them or racist against them or creating some kind of ableism is something that needs to be addressed with an urgent matter. So um, I would like for our cabinet or superintendent to bring us an update on what we're doing to specifically help with that, those issues. And um, also create a plan, if you can come back and let us know a plan on how we're gonna, you know, get our communication a little bit more up. One of the things in this SOFG framework as well, if we don't have smart goals, we have data, but if we're not putting any action or attainable goals to it, then all this is for show and just for fun. Um, I am, however, very appreciative that we got this done. I know it's the first time in the district that we actually have something that we can have sensible, attainable data and work towards to see how we make this more of an inclusive, equitable workspace. So I'm glad that our superintendent took the lead on this to be transparent and getting these issues fixed. But mm -hmm. if we can, and, and I'll leave it up to you, Mr. Mann, to give us a time frame on when you think um, that information is available. But I, I do want to send that sentiment all over the district that 
yes, our student outcomes are not going to change until the adult behaviors change. And by what I'm reading off of this, of our staff, is that adults in this institution are behaving with each other this way. And that is not acceptable. And it's, it's a culture that shouldn't exist in this environment for our staff, let alone our students. I think it's very important that we set a standard of everyone modeling kindness. The only way we're going to move the needle with our students is if all of our adults are, are modeling the behaviors that we want to see from those students. Absolutely. So um, whenever you have an opportunity to give us some feedback and see what we're doing um, to make sure that our staff not only feel supported, but actually safe and brave in their environment. Yep. We, I think what we'll do is we'll take a look at the data first before we commit to a timeline to see like what the lift actually is. Um, and then, and we probably won't get that for you in the next upcoming board update because it'll take more time than that to dig into it. But by the one after that, we should be able to have a timeline for you and kind of a course of action. And then thank you for that. And the only other question I have is how often do you feel in your professional capacity that we should be doing these kind of um, surveys so we know if we're moving up, if we're going down or if we're progressing or not? How often should we, is this a yearly thing? Is this every two years? Without survey burnout. <laughs> We yeah, yeah. Without survey burn now, but enough time to give us as an institution, you know, different implementation um, methods so we can actually keep getting our scores going up or lower in some instances. Well, and let me answer that if I can. When I first met Mr. Mann at the CUBE conference, I knew immediately he was a special superintendent. When I met the school board, I knew the school board was on board because of their energy with the presentation that we had shared and how much they got on board in terms of the relationship between the board and Mr. Mann. Very positive. One of the best districts I began to work with, and uh, Joe can attest to this too, because we did something extremely special. We got a survey launched within six weeks to present at the ASBA school board. We've never done that before. So that's huge steps in letting me know. And then also hearing some of the comments from some of the other board members tonight also reign supreme and you know, double down and triple down on the efforts, the energy of what Creighton ISD is doing. So that said, I have no issue in terms of knowing that the data that you have, you're gonna move forward with it. We always recommend at least doing it once a year. Why? Because that should at least give you enough time to implement some of the changes <clears throat> excuse me and incorporate some of the professional development in order to continuously move that needle forward so <clears throat> i offer that up with with uh much uh conviction okay thank you do we okay. one more question yeah go ahead going back to the just because you reminded me because you pulled the slide back up going back to that slide 19 i just had a clarification on how it's organized because on the right column the first five are repeated again uh, oh yeah those are oh, okay so it was just a question oh, yeah. on like how are these organized like why is there a space between those just got duplicated yeah it looks okay. like okay okay good yeah thank, thank you. you for that clarification i didn't know if there were like different categories or i was missing something so thank you any other questions or comments for Mr. Mann or Dell or Jill regarding Equimetrics data? I guess I was just surprised by how many people actually responded. I mean, honestly, it's kind of a good number. Um, was it just an email that was sent out one time, or how did that go? So I, I, I'm a huge fan of um, mea culpa. So um, sometimes we don't realize the wisdom of the partners that we work with. So when we when we launched the survey, um, it was primarily distributed via email. And, um, and, it, and one of the things that we had given guidance was, we've been doing all this phishing scam work. And so please don't <laughs> have this be a request from the superintendent, because we've been training everybody, you're going to get these phishing, oh, yeah. phishing scams <laughs> with a request from the superintendent. But the standard template that the team uses actually makes that request and it did indeed go out that way and i believe that i need to stand corrected because i do think it helped 
you know, even though we had those concerns around fishing, what we did to mitigate that was Emily sent out a notice to everybody. And then we followed up in the Creighton connection, you know, to make sure people were aware this one's not a scam asking you to do something for the superintendent. <laughs> this is genuinely a request because we really, and there was a nice letter that went with it about, you know, the importance and that we want to hear your voice. So, so I could be wrong. Like I thought I was a rock star last week and I clearly wasn't. Um, so I do have some delusions, but I, I do think the ask, like the way the ask was, was important. And then we get a lot of pushback on doing everything electronically. People always want us to, well, create paper forms, you know, do this. I think sometimes we water down, you know, sort of like when we create too many methodologies, people get confused and they don't know like which direction they're supposed to go, the consistency and then the repetition, because the other thing that the Infinity Systems team did is they kept track of who had responded or not. And then those who did not respond, they did um, multiple follow-ups with them. So I think I, 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 what I have to say is they were right. I was wrong. I don't, I don't mind admitting when I, when I'm wrong. Um, and then the other thing I would say is um, the methodology that they used was really, really effective. And they're a good partner because rather than putting the onus on us to get an effective return rate, they created the tool sets and the methodologies to ensure that we got a, an effective return rate. So you, you can quote that in your advertising material. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm just knowing kind of what that looks like. It sounds like it sounds like a chore to try to get people to respond. So I was impressed, even if it isn't above the 70% or whatever the target yeah. was. Now, do you all have the fun little screen that rewards you when you find the fishing thing and you report it? We, I, I like doing that do. at work. It's kind of fun. Yeah, we like, even yeah. had, I believe, um, since our <laughs> since our esteemed IT director is in the back of the room, I believe he even rewarded some people with some actual Swedish fish early yeah. on when they <laughs> implemented. Uh, so. I was going to say, we started giving out gold goldfish <laughs> when someone reports what they think might be a scam. <laughs> so, I was probably most reported this year for being a scammer. So. <laughs> Do, do you get Swedish fish just for that? I'll just go buy a bag of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, perfect. Do we have any other comments, questions? Perfect. Thank you guys so much for presenting. And thank you to all the staff who did it. Just know that I'm a true believer that we're going to take all the feedback that we got and act upon it. So you guys don't feel like your voices are just not being heard. So thank you for bringing this to us. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. Thanks for having us. Have a good night. All right. That brings us to good our night. next agenda item, which is 8A, approval of compensation for emergency split class coverage. And this says pilot. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Mann. Madam President, members of the board, I am going to hand this one to Dr. Lauren. Um, and I believe he has a presentation to share that kind of gives some of the background information on um, what's being recommended and how we got here. Madam President, members of the board, I'm uh, pleased to present this information and I would be even more pleased if I could get it to project. Uh, Russell, I'm getting a red. Um, I am so sorry. Before we start, I um, we have a public comment on this agenda item. I apologize. So I'm going to have the public comment um, read first, and then we can move into the discussion of it. Um, that's going to be from Daniel Lopez, and it is for this agenda item. And we have on his behalf, Miss Ariel. Oh, yeah, I know you always think, oh, Daniel, it must have been a rough year for you. You've changed. <laughs> You're looking good, Dan. <laughs> I love your shirt, by the way. Thank you. Also, this is from Daniel Lopez. Members of the board, as a member of the meet and confer team last year and this year, and a union member, the implementation of compensation for teachers split classes. Sorry, I'm reading from my phone. My phone's cracked. I'm so sorry. <laughs> this recommendation was passed. Oh, so I've been deeply frustrating. This recommendation was passed last year, and teachers are just last week being told by the district that they will not be compensated for split classes 
until this month, meaning all of our split classes from August to December are unpaid. We have been told that it is up to the board whether or not we are back paid for our split classes. So I'm asking you, please order that teachers will be back paid for the split classes that we have documented going back to August of this school year. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. And I will proceed with the presentation. And then if we have feedback off of that comment, we can after the presentation. Thank you. So uh, just to give some background, uh, we are recommending that the district pilot a plan that will compensate teachers impacted by accepting students from a split classroom by dividing the daily substitute rate of $160 per day among the affected teachers that are impacted by that split. So the number of teachers that are receiving students divided by 160 would be the amount of pay. Uh, the compensation does not currently appear on existing adopted salary schedules, so therefore it requires board approval. Uh, the pilot that we are proposing would run from February 1st through May 23rd. So just to give some little bit of a background on the story, really on any given day, our district's fill rate for guest teachers ranges between 49% and 82%, uh, obviously. Uh, there are some challenges with making sure that we have qualified guest teachers in the classrooms. Uh, we do understand that emergencies happen. Uh, there are often times when a substitute is established for a job for whatever reason, they are not able to fulfill that job. So maybe they have an emergency. Um, Mondays and Fridays tend to be the days where we have the most need. Uh, Wednesdays are the days where we tend to fill those uh, positions pretty easily. We've had a, as low as 38% coverage and we've had as high as 74% coverage. So it does vary widely. I think the consistency is that when a teacher is asked to absorb a different additional students for the day, oftentimes it's very limited in the amount of time they have to prepare. Uh, as a principal, I remember many, many days, almost every day, asking teachers to take additional students. Um, you know, Ms. Smith is sick. We have 25 students. Can you take five of her students? Uh, and that happens regularly and consistently across the district. And I know it's not just a specific Creighton issue. Um, so the, the conversation we've had in the meet and confer process over the last several years was how do we then recognize and uh, honor the teacher's willingness to help support and to be part of that solution to help students have a day with a teacher when there isn't one available. If you look at the uh, graph that I have posted, we took this data from the fall. Um, we looked at the number of absences or vacancies that need to be filled across the district. We had a total of 1,678 from August through December. Uh, of that, we had 903 that were filled by a substitute through our ESI partnership. Uh, that's the organization, the contract agency that provides our substitute service. So about 54% uh, of our vacancies were filled. Not filled were about 46%. Mind you, this includes teacher uh, assignments that aren't filled because we haven't hired that position. So sometimes we are you know, fortunate to have long-term subs that would be able to take on that position. Um, but often there, there's still that gap and we still have that need to fill that position. If you look at the bottom of the graphs, uh, sorry, the table at the bottom talks about what that cost is reflected in that $160 rate. So if we were to fill from last semester all vacant, vacant positions with a guest teacher at $160 per day, that would represent a $122,000 expense. If you add the cost of benefits to that, which is a 21% increase over the regular pay, then we're looking at $148,000 approximately. And that really is to kind of frame 
for our employees that we pay benefits for, that's the number that we're looking at. So if we're looking at how do we budget for filling these positions with staff from the Creighton district, that that's where that 21% would come in. I'll pause and see if anyone has any questions because I know sometimes tables need some conversation. Okay. I'm pretty sure I understand, but just for the clarity sure. of the public. So when we pay subs from Kelly Services, the district does not pay benefits. If we are paying teachers a similar rate to cover split classes, it's not like it's acting like a separate stipend or something like that. It gets rolled into the regular paycheck. And so it does in percentage of benefit matching that the district is. Yes, doing. that's correct. That's exactly right. I have a question. Yes. Where has the money <clears throat> been going? The savings been going for when we don't have subs before this? So I, I will defer to my partner, but I think uh, most the money that we've been using to cover subs over the last few years has been out of ESSER funds. So they're not necessarily earmarked as substitute funds. It's a pool of money that we draw from. What we're saying with this position or this idea is that we're now going to start to draw some of that money to help cover for teachers who need that compensation. So a lot of times it creates a cushion, right? So if we know that we're not funding these positions that are vacant, then we have that that money from something to go to somewhere. And, and again, just pointing out um, what Dr. Lauren, Lauren stated, for the last several years, these monies have been just coming down as needed. So there wasn't necessarily a, a budget effect so that we had to carry forward or anything like that since it was coming from those ESSER dollars. It is something that, um, and I think a big reason why we're looking at a pilot in order to see how much is it actually going to cost um and and getting some data as as we try to make a recommendation like this so we're trying to put together the initial and that's not even the is that the whole annual that's august that's, to december that's just correct? the fall yeah yes so just to it's going to cost us one hundred and forty eight thousand dollars if we do this pilot program from february to april i mean what's the date august to december that would be the amount for august to december yes so if we were to include, if we were to add August to December to the pilot, then you're looking at approximately that much money. The challenge is we don't know necessarily how well the record keeping has been kept for who had split classes, who didn't, if they did it equitably across sites. So did one site keep really accurate records and another site not? So those are other conversations for consideration that I want to bring up later in the presentation. I was say with that one thing, you know, as we move forward into full pilot, so this is aside from the do we go back to August to December, but moving forward into February is making sure that there's a system for that, not just to document it, but also right. how are sites distributing that because that's going to skew a lot of numbers. If I'm a teacher that because of how many sections we have in the grade level, I always get nine or 10 kids. But then at this school, they have four first grade classrooms, so they only get five or six kids, you know, and things like that. And and I know that that's a lot of numbers and variables, but we need some kind of guidance to make sure that it's being distributed properly and we're gathering the data accurately. Do we know how much do we pay? Of, um, how much do we pay of a service fee, if any, to that agency that gets as the subs? Is there a fee associated to the district for that service? Yeah, I believe it ends up being another, it's $200 per day. Yep. And, and this is not part of the presentation, but it's an important historical component to have because you might ask yourself, well, why don't we just have these individuals as our own employees? And the answer to that is Proposition 206. So when Prop 206 passed, most districts were pushed into a space to work through another firm because of the level of complexity of trying to manage the 206 required leave with individuals who work on a daily basis. So for um, for every 30, I'm probably going to get this wrong, so someone correct me if I'm wrong, 
if this, this doesn't have to be accurate, but just gives the concept. But for every 30 hours worked, I believe the employee is supposed to receive one hour of leave time. So if you have a, if you have subs doing that, now you create a brand new problem, which is where I've got I've got a science teacher who's out. I make a call to ESI. They assign us a substitute, and then the sub says, "Hey, I've built up eight hours of leave time. I'm going to call in sick today too." That really doesn't help the district. Actually, if you call ESI, that doesn't happen. But if they were our own employee, that could be a scenario that would occur. And so there, you know, no. I'm not dissing in Prop 206. There's a lot of wonderful things in it. But one of the things that they didn't do when they built it out is they didn't think about governmental agencies and how the impact would be very different than the way that it impacts private companies. Is that the is that correlated to or maybe it is what covers um, like they can only work 120 days out of it's a, it's a it's two separate ESI okay. programs. So the ESI substitute program is what we were driven to by virtue of Prop 206. The, the 120 days component has to do with return to work retirees, which also have our partner for that also happens to be ASI. So there's often confusion between those two programs because they're both with the same partner, but they're, they're two completely separate animals. Okay. And if I might add, um, one of the things that is not reflected in this information, and that's something that we're going to need to track also as we're going to roll out this pilot is the impact of contract subs, because we do have employees at each campus that are permanent subs that are Creighton employees that are hired to be in classrooms. So what you're seeing, the impact you're seeing here is not even considering those positions on that campus, right? So some of that vacancy might have been absorbed by somebody on campus rather than doing a split. So that's something that we have to figure out a way to disaggregate that a little more closely. Uh, and just noting, I'm I'm sorry, Ms. McSheffrey, go ahead. Um, so this this that we're looking at right now, this isn't actually what we're voting on tonight. This is just it is information. Not. It's based. just information. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, I will add though that since we've been gathering the input from the sites over the last what today is the fifth, um, we've had sixteen absences that have been covered by split teachers or by splits that sites have put in. Now, it, there's a timing of whether a site has put it in immediately or they wait till the next day. So there might be more that comes to it, but we've already seen use of the uh, input measure so that we can start to gather that information. Um, one question I have, and I don't know if you have a straight answer, but we have various principles here. Do they usually end up using more of the split service in the classrooms versus the, what is it called, the ESI? Yeah, the, the preference from my personal experience, um, the preference is always to have a, a substitute teacher. Uh, the limitation is that there aren't enough subs to go around. So uh, when I met with our ESI rep a couple of weeks ago, there are 90 substitutes that would be available to work in Creighton District, 58 regularly work in Creighton District. So we're part of our conversation when I was talking to our rep from ESI is how do we bolster that? So what do we do to draw substitutes to the Creighton District and help them feel welcome, valued, um, supported? What are some ways that we can maybe reach out more, do some recognition programs, things like that, so that we can increase the number of subs that choose to come to Creighton rather than go next door to Madison or to go to Osborne or Baltz. Well, that's hard too. Like, I wonder, they're not our employees, but I wonder if there's a way that ESI maybe can do some, I don't want to call it a survey, but some kind of outreach to get yep. input because I know, like, I've been a teacher where I've had a sub, you know, that I was scheduled a month out and then the day of it was canceled and sometimes you find out why and sometimes you don't, but there were times when we found out why, and it was, oh, well, last minute I got offered one that's closer to my house, mm -hmm. so I didn't have to do the commute that day. You know, like, it's, and I get it, you know, it's <laughs> people's lives, but it's often a financial, like, and a, you know, decision for them that, okay, this is better for me to do this day. Um, so I would just be interested in how we could get some of that information, not us specifically, but you all 
in trying to do exactly what you're talking about is like, let's bolster the frequency of getting subs because yeah, this is the splitting classes is never the ideal. It's the last resort. Mm -hmm. We want to compensate for when it happens, but there's definitely a root problem. Right. <laughs> and it's not right. Creighton specific. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, to give a little bit of background, so there were discussions last year in the in a net, uh, interest based negotiation process through meet and confer to recommend to the board that we created a, a way to recognize and honor teachers to compensate them for this work. There was a little bit of um, confusion in some of the language. So in some documents, it says uh, to give leave time as a, a payment for split classes. Some of the documentation was actual dollars so that when we met as a compensation committee to start to do this work in the fall we talked about what would the benefits of either option be the one that we as a committee decided to focus on was doing the um, splitting the pay of the substitute rate uh, comparing it to local districts we did compare to a lot of districts near our site or our school districts and most do some sort of monetary compensation i think there was one that offered professional development and one that was a little squishy about well we don't really do that right now in that way um, so when we had that idea of moving forward with this then we started to do some of the work of planning to have that implemented yeah because if you offer a leave you can accidentally contribute yes to <laughs> that's right that's right you're just you're kicking the can down the like road. you're you're incentivizing by saying take more days not that we shouldn't yep. take days off but self-care is important but i wouldn't want to incentivize causing more strain on additional teachers yeah so just to give an idea of what our planning and vetting process was most of the work came through the compensation committee um, we had a couple of meetings in the fall plus a subcommittee meeting that looked at this information uh, we took it to executive team for feedback triad if you're familiar with our triad team that's our finance department human resources grants and payroll so it's basically the fiscal services side of the house and we meet weekly to problem solve and triad was very helpful in developing some of the processes so that we wouldn't overburden the payroll department for instance because that's going to be a pretty heavy lift for payroll and to recognize from the business services perspective who monitor and supervise the office managers from a site uh, systems perspective, is this going to overburden or overtax the office managers, for instance? Uh, so we also went to leadership council, talked to office managers, uh, brought it back to meet and confer for additional input in January and then through the Creighton Connection. Uh, this is just an overview of the people that were most involved in the compensation committee on this process. Uh, there were some teachers or some individuals who were on the committee that weren't really involved in this process. Um, but we have a, the teachers there for you to see and the other staff members. So this is an overview of the pilot structure. So from February 1st through May 23rd, uh, basically what's gonna happen on a daily basis is that there will be at each site an opportunity to identify by teacher and grade level who needs the coverage, determine the number of teachers that will be impacted up to nine. So that means that for some of those situations, there's going to be a much smaller payout if you're dividing by nine teachers. And we also had that as a request from one of the principals because often in middle school and different situations, there are different ways of splitting and it might vary from site to site. So we wanted that to at least be an option. Currently, the, the information that I'm seeing on the spreadsheet is that most of the splits are between four and six. So far, so far. Um, we talked about the rate, so we'll take that $160 daily rate and we'll divide it by the number of teachers who are receiving students. Um, there's a documentation through Google Form. We're also asking that the site supervisor administrator sign off on that process so that there's a verification of the expense for the payment. Uh, and then that compensation will be paid out monthly. So it's going to be off cycle for our payroll department so that they're, it, it's not gonna be an every paycheck implementation of the payment. That'll also kind of give 
for lack of a better term, this would give a, a bigger pot of money at one time, right? So if there's a, let's say I'm a third grade teacher and I get classes split to me four times, then that's four times maybe $40 a day rather than one time with $40, which you don't see that as easily in a paycheck. So Yay for my extra $12. <laughs> right, right. That, in the latte, right? Uh, quick question. So the yes. daily sub rate is 160 but we pay ESI 200 Is that right? Yeah, I'll verify the amount, but okay. I think that okay. that's the rate because that's the rate we use when we figure grants. Okay. A couple of concerns. So um, one of the concerns that we heard earlier from the comment was that the pilot does not address split classes from August to January. So we'll uh, be interested to hear the board's feedback on that concern. Um, I think part of the challenge, as I mentioned before, the documentation for that, how do we make sure that we're being good stewards of public funds by knowing exactly what is accounted for in that since there was such a long gap. And it is frustrating. I know that there's frustration that it took long, a long time to get to this place with this process, but I feel like we're, we're on the right track as far as the systems we have in place, and hopefully it'll be sustainable, uh, which is the next point that we can work with our business services with uh, Ms. Shapiro and talk about how we can forward fund this through the future. Um, can I ask a follow-up question yes. there? Um, I know that it's my understanding that through some of the recommendations from Meet and Confer last year that we're going to require extra time to implement. There were like implementation calendars that were figured out for that. Is that my understanding for some of the items on the recommendations? And I guess my question then is, was there one for this? And if, if not, why not? I don't remember there being implementation calendars okay. or deadline specific, um, but I can go back and take a look. I, okay. I just recently went through since we're, we're, we have our meet and confer session tomorrow. And one of the requests was to look back at all of the recommendations that have gone to the board. And I know this is ancillary to this topic, but the sentiment from meet and confer the team is that there's some duplication of effort from year to year or there are things that get talked about that don't necessarily get addressed and then how do we know it's been addressed or what's the time frame for making sure that it's addressed appropriately so i think those are really great points that i'll make sure to bring to our meeting tomorrow yeah i guess what i'm trying to get at is ha having heard the public comment and hearing this i guess i'm trying to find out i know it's one comment but like was there an expectation i know maybe the expectation was as soon as possible that could be all dependent on a lot of things right sure. but i guess how is this going to land um what were the expect what was the general expectation of people when and what information was i guess communicated from meet and confer people to teachers and i'm just wondering then like is that where this request is coming from I, i'm just i just want us to not like um completely ignore the comment that was um maybe i can provide a little bit of insight on that it is that last time if i remember correctly um this was put on the me and confer recommendations however that was at the same time we were having the discussions with the stipends so i think what ended up happening is that we kind of all got into the honing in of giving the ten thousand dollar stipends and retention so it kind of drifted away and maybe through both ends drop the ball because it wasn't really talked about more. But I rem I, I vaguely remember being in executive session, some of this stuff being talked about and then us kind of switching gears on that because then the topic became, you know, the whole stipends and doing the $10,000 back and forth. So that's from what I recall. Um, I'm more talking about like what, because even if we had that conversation, right, there were still recommendations that were presented to us, and I believe this was in that. It was, yes. And I think that the, what was lacking was a specific timeline. Uh, and I will take responsibility for kind of being behind the eight ball on some of this because, you know, transitioning and making sure that yeah. we're moving forward uh, in a way that honors our process in our committee structure um, to make sure that we're doing that feedback loop and we're making sure that we're engaging as many stakeholders as we can uh, to get some input, um, knowing that 
there's this this expectation that's yeah. kind of pushing it. And I do I do appreciate that, and I do understand yeah. the frustration. I, so I'm wondering, is there a way or what the cost would be to meet somewhere in the middle? Like if we were to back pay from January, I mean, I'm curious what that looks like. Well. And if I may add, um, I was actually going to see if we could table this. So it could, I wanted to ask specific questions on budget, what it looks like if we did, you know, that and give the information back to us and bring it up to the next board meeting. So we have that budget numbers. And that was one of the questions I was going to ask if we did do the back pay. What does that look like? Because I know that we don't really have a system in place of who did what and who split what classes. So if we tentatively try to do something what does that look like how much that's going to cost us and then i forget the other question because i jumped the gun but um i i was going to propose that we table this for the next board meeting so we can get some of those questions answered and then we can make a more fiscally responsible decision in all parties just to clarify you're saying table all of this or just table the august to January part. Because I would say to people all of everything because I it, it can just the way that my brain works, I don't know. And we can we're all not decide voting on we're not August voting, to yeah. January. So this is just informational. The only thing we're voting on is to start the pilot in February. So we don't oh, yeah, so yeah. want to delay that. Yeah, if I and if I could make but, a suggestion. Yeah, go ahead, and, Mr. Man. Shapiro, feel free to like reach this far and smack me across the face if, <laughs> if i say something wrong I, I i think i think the biggest challenge january and and um is that it you know i it, it was a surprise to me to find out that there was a site that had been tracking but we were unaware of that um it is my understanding and maybe some of the folks in the audience could help with nods of the head that is not universally true across the district so that so the the biggest challenge is the equity issue that it would create um i do believe and people will want to strangle me because this will create a work hardship on them but i do believe you know january 8th is so recent that we probably could backwards engineer that and there's absolutely no reason and i'm getting the face from miss shapiro so correct me i don't mind <laughs> I, I hope i've made it abundantly clear nice. i don't mind being wrong but um I guess what I would say is I would want to vet the process um, with the site leadership uh, and and probably run it through our auditors to make sure that it is auditable oh, good point. Um, and that we could uh, gather information like that, what that should look like. I want to get some guidance on that. When you're saying that, you're talking about back pay? Or back pay. Talking? I'm talking yeah. about a back, like a process to go back and gather information. Okay. What should that look like and what does it need to have included with it to stand up for audit? Do we have the ability to pull that information working with our site leadership? I was going to say, like, as, as much as I think it's a valid discussion, I think there's a lot of things like that that we can't even make right. a recommendation. I know we're not voting, but if not all schools have been tracking net for the pilot, we have a tracking system. Yeah. I would love to pay everybody back to August. Don't get me wrong. I, one, from an equity perspective, don't want to pay the teachers who split classes at one or two schools and not at others or five teachers at this school but miss two of them. Um, and then also, additionally, if there wasn't a process in place, like that's we don't we that could be sticky legally. <laughs> so, th so there's an expression I love, which is "Don't let the great be the enemy of the good." Right? Yes. So um, there is absolutely nothing preventing Ms. Shapiro and Dr. Lauren from looking into the feasibility of going back to any of that back pay. You would not prevent that if you voted on moving forward with the February 1st pilot. And I feel like we would be adding, and I'm sure other people will be mad at me, and there's always someone who's going to be mad at me, but we have teachers out there that are splitting classes, and I'd like to start getting them paid. Yes. Yes. So I, my personal recommendation would be to vote on the February 1st if you're if you're in favor of it. We have we have the numbers and the statistical data for that. If we hold off too long, yes, we'll continue to collect the data, mm -hmm. but you know it it right. that means people are waiting that additional period of time in order to get that payout. And you know, regardless of what happens with January 8th to February 1st or August to February 1st, regardless of any of that. 
I think it's important that we start compensating now and that we start gathering this data so we can get you a solid recommendation come like right around the corner where we're going to be needing to make <laughs> recommendations about budget for next year. Yeah, but I think my request, it, I didn't think it would necessarily involve tabling. I think, you know, we obviously just talked all about areas for growth, communication. We've, as a board and superintendent and leadership team, understand the work that we're having to do to rebuild trust in this district. And so I think that that's a big component. And anytime when there's valid concerns, like maybe, and I'm just assuming the place that was tracking this is the same place where the complaint is coming from. And so there was clearly some in, in expectation that was misinterpreted. Yeah. And so I would hate for that to fester into something that's unnecessary. And so I would like for us to do the best we can to figure out how to address that. Yeah. And one of the things I know we are doing as a practice now, and others can correct me on this if I misspeak on it, but the communication that goes out for meet and confer is being compiled by Ms. Wazolik. So she comes to the end of the meetings to gather that from the group. The group reviews it. She actually throws a draft into a chat. And then that draft is reviewed by the members to make sure that everything in that draft is accurate. So, um, so the beauty of that is that um, everyone should have a common understanding of what the information is. I will tell you as a human being who works <laughs> with a lot of other human beings, regardless of that fact, there will be people who make claims that, you know, the information is different than what's, you know, on the black and white piece of paper. And so I think it's really important for everyone involved in the process to make sure that they're part of that conversation at the end of the meeting. They're ensuring that's what's reflected is accurate and that they're participating in that chat group to make sure that anything that's captured erroneously gets corrected before it's pushed out in the Creighton connection, you know, at, at the end of the day, because that is ultimately the public record that we have of what what's being recommended forward that and then the presentations and, and the information Dr. Lauren presented to you tonight came directly from what was presented by meet and confer as recommendations last year. Perfect. Any other questions or comments? Oh, go ahead, Ms. Ayers. So um, my one question is about half day coverage. Yes. Um, so are you going to do, so like if a teacher leaves half day, then are you going to take half of like the $80 yes. and then do that? Okay. Yep. That's an option on the form okay. for them to note that it's a half day coverage, which is not the same as an early release. I was going right. to say it's um, a difference early, with when no, the release is still a full sub day. Right. Yeah. Um, and so just just for the people on the board that haven't experienced this, um, I think there are some great benefits to this. Um, I think it creates value with people um, and showing, um, you know, that that they do deserve to have something when they take in extra students in their classroom. Um, I've been lucky enough that I have a very small classroom this year. So when my teammates are gone, I take their whole class, which I think also creates value because the teacher, I mean, the kids are getting an actual teacher that is, um, you know, able to teach a subject and continue the learning on. Um, and I think it also helps like our, our problem with subs, um, every district is going through sub shortages, um, especially after the pandemic, when people are like, peace out, I'm done. Um, so I think that's a benefit. I think you've solved one of the deficits that I find in my district is that um, how to capture the accuracy. So I really like your Google forms. I'm going to take that back to my team um, because sometimes we rely on our secretaries to, to, to do all the work. And then when they don't do it, then we get upset and then it creates like a big chaos because some of us, like in my district, we haven't been paid like for all of our time. And it might just be one or two schools because of that secretary. So that creates chaos. But I think you solved it with the Google form. Plenty of incentive to fill out a Google form. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so um, I, I, I just find it as a huge benefit. I'm sorry that we can't. Like the back pay, I think it would be a nightmare if everybody was doing it and it was equitable. Yes, I feel... Um, bad. I feel also that I totally understand um, where they're coming from because as teachers, we always have teacher friends in other districts and we know that other districts have been doing this. Um, my districts have been doing it for the last three years. And so I feel like we're behind 
everyone else. And so I kind of understand that frustration because I feel like we should have been doing this a long time ago. Um, but nevertheless, those are just kind of my thoughts on those. Thank you, Ms. Ayers. Any other discussion or questions? Okay, thank you so much for that presentation. And um, so if I read this as is, it does not include the back pay. Yeah. Making sure. So with this, I move the governing board approve the pilot to provide additional compensation for emergency class split coverage from February 1st through May 23rd, 2024. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And Madam President, members of the board, we, you know, Ms. Shapiro will look into the feasibility of, of other options. Um, Dr. Lauren will look into, you know, what do we have as far as record keeping? And then we'll be able to bring back to the board, you know, if there's any feasibility of closing any of that gap. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. That brings us to our next item, which is 10A, fiscal year 24-25 budget projection. And I will hand it over to Ms. Shapiro. Madam President, board members, and Superintendent Ann, I am excited to present our initial budget figures to be used uh, building the fiscal year 24-25 proposed budget. Um, this also is the process that allows us to calculate a dollar figure to take to our meet and confer, which we will be doing tomorrow um, evening. I think we're ready for that presentation, Russell. Somehow I get the best presentations. I'm not sure that's planned, but I'm excited about this one. You're being sarcastic. Not at all. Not even a little bit. <laughs> like if you guys knew me, you don't. I, I very much goober over numbers, and I get very excited when I get into um, a wonderful organization that has made very good decision making uh, to plan for. We're just gassing up Jay tonight. I know. No, no, we're we're. I'm excited because I finally found someone geekier about these numbers. <laughs> just don't get me going on account codes. Uh, that's happy. We need an exact session for that. No, <laughs> I sat through an entire day with Jay before I was even on this. Program. This is a true story, and you were hardcore in that session. <laughs> I don't like numbers. Yeah. So, um. I think I, I did put a lot on the slide. I apologize. I probably should have cut this into pieces so that we can kind of go through and discuss. A lot of this information has been presented to the board and to meet and confer in past sessions where I had a lot of information as opposed to dollar figures. So these are the dollar figures that come from some of those items that we've discussed in the past. These are our inputs and uh, decreases that would be going into our next budget year. So if you'll take a look at that first item, that's our FY24 adjustment for our 100th day ADM. We have to project our enrollment. Our enrollment was projected very well, um, which means that when we do our budget revision in May, we are looking uh, to go ahead and add back into our budget approximately $447,000. Keep in mind, these figures are preliminary and proposed. Um, they are subject to change, but these are numbers that I feel confident that um, this is probably what it's going to be like unless something very extreme were to happen at the legislature, which we would all be needing to deal with. This is great. Um, our, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> our um, FY25 projected enrollment, um, we had discussed this before. We are seeing a slight decline, uh, or I would say it's slowing down a little bit. So we're still having declining enrollment. It just isn't declining as quickly or rapidly as we've seen in the past. I did make an adjustment in the budget number for that. Um, a big factor when you're doing budget is you're going between two different data points. So you're looking at enrollment, which isn't how we're budgeted. You have the ADM, which is a, a proportionate share of a student's uh, 100 days of membership. They may have 20 days, they may have 100 days, we get a factor of one if they have 100 days. So there is a slightly different um, calculation when you turn these into budget numbers. And that's why I've put in there the 228 total weighted student count, which is what would affect a budget. Um, so with that declining enrollment, I'm looking at 
a little bit at $1.1 million out of uh, less in our budget because of the declining enrollment. We also have our 2% base support amount increase there, which another good to the positive number. Then we're gonna have to take a look at our expense adjustments. We know that we're gonna factor in something for inflation. Um, right now it's tracking about 3.1%. I like to tighten that up as we get closer to the proposed budget in June. So that number can potentially change if inflation, when I go and check the CPI numbers is uh, increased. I'm feeling pretty good with the 3.1. Um, again, historically, this is a process that I've used for many years. So I feel pretty comfortable in this um, space. Some really good news, um, our minimum wage, we're not needing to make an adjustment in this next budget year because Creighton has already brought the minimum wage base above minimum wage. And we actually have a couple of cycles we'll be get, getting through before we have to worry about it since we're at $15 an hour. And um, projecting, again, it gets kind of projected with that CPI because that's how they base that calculation for the next increase iteration in January. I'm anticipating it to be about 1480. Again, these are <laughs> way out. And as I get closer to those um, dates, uh, those numbers will get tighter. Uh, inflation to goods and services, I've got it the 3.1, so that's an additional 195,000 coming out of our budget just for increased cost. We also know that there is a utilities increase out there of 11.3% with APS. Um, anticipating that around 200,000, um, it's another one to kind of wait and see. Um, throughout the year, we do have where class sizes will get larger. We need to um, put out for another teacher or another staff member of some sort. This is a very typical budgeting component, which is a contingency fund for HR so that they can address those needs throughout the year. I'm recommending to replenish that funding of um, approximately $500,000. We also got, um, no, I'm sorry, I skipped past it because I have my glasses on. The medical cost increase was zero this year. Fantastic. Again, a lot of great decision making from the administration prior to me getting here. Um, we saw some uh, good results moving from uh, one program to our new program. It did, I believe, cause a little bit of angst during that process and that turnover. Uh, and it seems to be working very well. And people have um, been able to get the medical care that they need. We had an ASRS decrease of 0.02%. I don't know why. I just put it on there. 5,000 to the good. <laughs> I know that that number never goes in our favor. So I was just kind of excited. It's usually, you know, taking more every year. So that was interesting. Um, through attrition, again, with that declining enrollment, we will have natural attrition. So that number goes back into our budget. We have a couple of uh, numbers here that are gonna depend on some conversations that we have through the process. And you'll see a little more of that in the ESSER presentation will be happening right after this one, where we have some existing positions that had been moved for funding purposes into ESSER with the anticipation that those would move back in. Some of those are uh, m and funded positions and that's the cost there. Some of those were grant funded positions. So the intent is to move those back into those grant funding sources if available. We also had some new ESSER created positions, um, specifically those contracted subs. Uh, there was an IT help desk position and a plant manager position. Um, I have those coming back into the m and budget. There are some conversations going on with some additional positions, so that number potentially could change um, as we go through the other presentation. I know they'll be speaking to that. We also have that budget balance carry forward, which has um, been targeted to be spent down. And that was collected over those several years of ESSER in order to prepare for this year. Um, we also have some information that's coming out very loud and clear from the Auditor General's office that fund balance, uh, fund balance management is something they're specifically going to be looking at in performance evaluations or in performance audits. So you wanna make sure that you have a very um, uh, a clear and concise plan with your targeted spend down. 
um, and with the management of your fund balances. So I will be bringing additional information in the future as I develop that plan for Creighton and um, uh, provide that information to the board of what that plan will look like. So when we're audited, it'll be nice, clean, and transparent. Um, that brings us down to the bottom, which is a black number. That's great. It's in the plus. That's two two million with a little bit of change. And um, if we can go to the next screen, I'm so used to that number being red. I'm just <laughs> number is never not red. Um, that's why I was so excited about this presentation. So what that means is uh, we're taking approximately $2 million of m and ongoing salary support to meet and confer tomorrow. Ongoing salary support are the dollars that would um, uh, be used to provide salary increases and could be ongoing. So those would be percentage increases in salaries of whatever that looks like. It could be um, percentage increases of longevity. Um, it, it'll be up to the meet and confer group to kind of make determinations on the best utilizations of those m and ongoing salary supports based on the direction from the board. The other uh, monies available for meet and confer this year is the 1.2 million of one-time funding. That was uh, Governor Hobbs uh, state aid adjustment that was made into this year uh, that we've um, going to that would have carried forward in our budget balance carry forward uh, that we're going to pull out as a one time. It's just one time monies. So uh, that would be stipends, retention, things that are like one time only cost. It's not something that's going to be carried on into future ongoing monies. We also have about 600,000 of one time funding coming from those fund balance adjustments. So about 1.8 in um, one time funding. I went ahead and put. Um, it's kind of like a menu. So meet and confer will make some determinations after their uh, conversations and their interests. And um, so I give them the amounts of things. So 1% salary costs, which would be something that could be funded out of that ongoing salary support is $347,000. So however many percents they want to use out of that 2 million, I believe it comes out to be about 5.7% if we just do the math. But again, if there's a an interest to put some of that towards longevity or to put that in different areas, however that looks, I just won't know. So this is not to say what we are doing with those monies. This is just to give some information of what a 1% would cost. And Ms. Shapiro, that 1% is for all staff? That 1% is for all staff that would be funded from general fund. So when I calculate that, um, I will say that I do include grant funded positions because grants can't necessarily take on the increases that we bargain for. Um, so we do need to calculate that into our number. We do try to put those increases in the grants, but if not, we're not going to not give increases there. So it would have to be supported from the general fund. Okay. Um, also the cost of a $1,000 retention stipend and those would be one-time funded dollars could be used in that area is um, 874,000 and that is based on the recent $5,000 stipend that was just paid. Again, just math. Thank you for that presentation. Board, do we have any questions, comments, concerns? Hearing none, the only one that I have is I, I feel like you. It's very nice to see this not being in the red. Um, before I got on the board, I would come to these budget meetings and I was like, red everywhere, what's going on? So it is really nice to see that. So thank you for the information. Yeah, it's almost a wash for the um, base uh -huh. of an budget adjustment, so that's exciting. And I will say that based on some of the conversations tonight, I would have to bring in, um, when we're talking about uh, the split compensation, those dollars would, you know, uh, could affect that $2 million. So we'll start with that, and then uh, any effects to that, um, we would bring back to let you guys know what the final dollar figure was of what Meet and Confer had um, to negotiate with. Awesome. Thank you so much for that information. All right. Um, 
That brings us back to 10B, and we do have a public comment for this, so I will go ahead and call up Ms. Ariel up here first to give us a public comment, and then we can go into the presentation. Thank you, board, um, Madam President. Uh, my name is Ariel Williams. I'm a teacher in the district. Um, I would like to speak to a disagenda item. So the greatest asset of a school district is its students and teachers. So today I'm here to ask you if you care. Teachers have been screaming into the void for years about what they need. Watching leadership drum through, jump through hoops to find fundings for CJAs at the expense of their teachers has been mind numbing. Teachers who once believed in creating district are walking away and it feels like no one cares. Hearing teachers say, I can no longer, I no longer have the personality for teaching and creating school district. My personality is too playful. Why can't our kids have teachers that are playful? Teachers spending hours of their personal time planning and prepping, but nothing ever seems enough. Do you care? If we call ourselves CGAs, will you jump through, hoop, through the same hoops to find the funding for smaller class sizes? ELIT teachers who have become essential to providing quality ELD pullout and an additional two teachers on every site to provide reading intervention for students fourth through eighth grade. 70% of the middle school students at Gateway are testing high risk for phonics. If we start calling our fourth through eighth graders CJAs, will we find the funding to provide reading interventionists for them? So there is hope after Creighton. So the teachers who once believed in Creighton, people like Tim Knorr will continue to believe in Creighton. ESSER funds are gone and CJAs need to follow. We want smaller class sizes to make students' behaviors more manageable. We need academic support for struggling students. We need a cell curriculum and time built into the day. We need more adults in the building that can provide academic supports. Thank you. Ms. Ariel, I'm gonna keep you up here for a few seconds because I have a question and I don't know if the other board members have a question and this is why I appreciate you speaking to this item because we can have this honest dialogue back and forth. Um, it in your professional opinion, what have you noticed the CJAs have done and have you noticed that since CJAs have been on campus, any behavior issues fixed, gotten better? Um, no. For Alan can speak to what I've seen. Um, for example, I have asked many times for our CGA to go and to address bullying, I like do lessons daily, do groups, do something to address bullying and racism that's happening. And he has, nothing's happened. Um, it's just basically the kids run out of the classroom to go spend time in the CJA office room. Um, if you go in there, kids are laying on the floor. For example, a uh, first grader hit my one of my fourth graders in his private area. And I went into the room and I saw him laying on the floor, you know, snacking on the iPad. And I was like, you know, he just hit a kid in the private area. Yeah, I know. He had a rough morning. I'm like, yeah, my kid did too. But okay. But I just, I don't feel like we've seen a change in behavior in the past two years to justify CJAs. And I understand the purpose behind CJAs when it was first built was, they were going to provide professional development to teachers. They were going to teach teachers how to do community circles. They were going to help teachers implement social emotional learning. And none of those things has ever happened. When was the last time you guys had a community circle at the site that you're at? What do you mean? Like um, our principals sometimes lead one on Wednesdays where we all separate into two circles and they ask us a question and the teachers pass something around and we answer it. If that's what you mean. But nothing integrated with students. No, not really. Not that I've seen. Okay. Yeah, of course. And then I'm going to defer it to other board members if they have any questions. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but thank you so much for being bold and having this honest conversation with us because it is important. And maybe this question 
Can Maybe I just you... point out, just, I'm sorry, just a housekeeping thing. The last time we did this, I don't know if you remember, oh, you weren't here that day. Lori Bird, who is, a, who is our replacement attorney for the night, said we, were, we are not allowed to do this Q&A. Do you remember, Hilda? I was scolded and yelled at um, and yelled at and yelled at by her <laughs> because okay. supposedly it's a violation of open meeting law. So oh, yeah. just, I appreciate your Even insight. Even if it's agendized? Even if it's agendized, just because we're talking about a specific position that could be discussing lines on personnel issues. Got it. Thank you for bringing that up, Ms. McSheffrey. I would just stop and say, I would rather have you know, reading and for interventionists for fourth through eighth graders on every site and e lit teachers who can provide EOD pullout on every site. Rather, if I had to pick over CJA positions, I like the idea of what it was, the purpose behind the idea was behind it. I think it was great, but I think there's, there's just so many bigger fires that needs to be put out first. And a lot of that has to do with instruction and students having the ability to access the education in the classroom. So a lot of their behavior could be stemming from the fact that they just cannot access the curriculum because either their reading is too low, their writing too low, their math is too low. And I think we should probably try interventionists, especially in that four eighth band, to see if we will have a decrease in behavior if students start to feel more successful in the classroom. Thank you. Did you just want to give it? My question wasn't really for her. My question was a was just a question in general, I suppose, with C, CJAs. Um, are they are they teachers like or are they counselors? Like, what's their background? I guess I just want to know. That was my question. And if it's not appropriate, I don't have to answer. You can tell me it's not appropriate, but. I mean, that's just that, yeah, I just had that general question. And Mr. Dubin, before you proceed, um, Ms. Ariel, thank you so much for bringing that information up. I appreciate you coming up and speaking. Go ahead, Mr. Dubin. Um, the child justice advocates are, um, they're considered teachers on assignment. So they are funded as, as teachers. They do work extra days beyond a typical teacher contract. So their scope is similar to say an instructional coach or an effective schools coach. The credentials that they have vary depending on the role. So some of them do have teacher certification. Some of them have a background in um, like, um, like social emotional learning support or counseling. I, I believe only one of the people in that role actually has full, um, like a master's in social work or that kind of credential. They're not counselors, they are not social workers because they're not creden credentialed as such. Thank you. All right, and with that in the public comment, um, we will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Dupin um, for the presentation of this transition planning of ESSER three funds. As soon as I get onto the screen, we'll get started. Oh, I don't think it's fine. If I use that in a courtroom, I think you're fine. <laughs> don't have any shame. Okay. Well, this evening we're going to share with you just an update on where we are with the ESSER funds in terms of the overall investment and then recommendations for the transition away from use of those ESSER funds for key priorities. Whenever we talk about ESSER funds, oh, I wanna point out really quickly, I'm gonna be supported in this conversation by Ms. Shapiro. And I wanna introduce, if you don't know, uh, Ms. Jasmine Hyatt Dominguez. Jasmine, would you mind coming up? Just take the podium. Jasmine is a coordinator in our effective schools department and she's been really instrumental, especially the last, last year and a half in making sure that we're, we're managing effectively our grant funds and she's been a huge support to Ms. Burkhart and the other members of that team. So uh, we're, we're bringing her forward this evening to assist us um, in this conversation. Can I, can I add to that? Please she do. came in absolutely clutch 
when we ran afoul of delays at ADE in order to get the $5,000 stipend work through the system in time to get it paid. And so um, without Ms. Domingos, wow. we probably would not have managed to pull that off. And it would so, have been a mutiny. And <laughs> well, I would probably not be sitting here with you today, but, um, and so I'm not sure whether I appreciate her for that or not. I'm just teasing, but I, um, I just wanted to take the moment because I think sometimes people don't know what people do in the district and they also don't know how critical they are to some of the important things that happen. And um, to me, that f our, our staff really deserved and needed that $5,000. And um, Ms. Dominguez was one of the key people who made that happen. That's yeah. really helpful. That term effective schools is pretty broad. And well, and we were reflecting today <laughs> as we get into this, we manage ESSER through, certainly it's, there's an intersection with our finance team, our HR team, um, payroll team but a, but a lot of the overall oversight happens through effective schools and it that team has been set up to manage the existing entitlement funds that we've relied on for many years and with the ESSER funds it you know the way we kind of thought about it this morning was like you know the regular system was kind of like draining a bathtub when the ESSER funds came in it was like trying to drain a lake Mm -hmm. with the same number of individuals, the same kinds of systems. And so some of the challenges we've encountered internally have been based on just that infrastructure. So Jasmine in this role has been, is an example of a change that was made to help move those funds along. And her expertise has been, has been uh, very critical. So we're grateful. And thanks for being here tonight. Your reward is a yeah. board meeting. <laughs> you do a good job and you come to the board meeting. Um, good evening. <laughs> So whenever we talk about ESSER funds, we always try to bring back to the original purpose that was established by the original task force at the, you know, at the outset of the availability of the funds. And this is uh, repeated information, so I'll be brief. Um, just the idea that we wanted to use the monies to address much of what even was described in the public comment, where we're looking for, you know, supporting empowering the community, because at that time that was a huge, huge issue. Um, connecting with families and neighbors, making sure that we're holistically nurturing mind, body, and spirit. Um, reading was identified as a, as a fundamental priority and making sure that all of our students had what they need to read fluently and inspiring our teachers to use the best, best methods and the best resources. So all the, all the investments, all the work has, has been intended to align toward this broad set of purposes. As you know, the ESSER funds came to us in actually four different buckets, but we're currently in that ESSER three period and we have until September 30th of this year to draw down the remaining funds. And with that, Jasmine's gonna work her magic. Perfect. Uh, good evening, Madam President, board members, executive team. So this is a, a chart to represent where we're at with our current ESSER expenditure. Um, this is only for ESSER three you'll see that there are um, a really large portion of blue funds, light blue and dark blue. The light blue funds are um, our current percent, about 73% of our funds that are have been encumbered or expended, which means that those are funds that we either have open purchase orders for or have already spent down in our total S or three allocation. So remember that this allocation spans three years. Um, and so it's any, any time within that three year period. Um, the remaining funds, the dark blue, the 5.2, yep, those are obligated, which means that in our budget, we have budgeted them for a specific purpose that aligns with um, the plan set forth by our task force at the beginning of our ESSER allocations. Those funds would only be changed if we went through an amendment process because they've currently already been approved by ADE. Our last approval was in December. The 15.4 and the 6.4, those are part of our LEA set-aside funds. Uh, ESSER has a requirement where 20% of our funds go to mitigating learning loss. And so those funds have a specific purpose. We have 15.4 that have been obligated toward, you know, items such as summer school or our ELIT program, et cetera, things that specifically we are doing to mitigate the learning loss. And the 6.4 is the portion of it that's already been spent down. So this is just a dollar amount because I think sometimes it's really helpful to see uh, what does that translate to? What portion of our 30 million allocation are we talking about? So our, 
again, light blue, that is the funds that have been already expended or encumbered, uh, just over 22 million. And I should say too, this is as of uh, the approval of our second amendment, which was in December. And this also, the blue also includes the second half of the, oh, of absolutely. the stipend payout for the end of the year. Yeah, that blue is our entire stipend payout, which is about 9 million. Um, so that's all been encumbered because we already have, you know, it's already set up in our system to go to all staff that will qualify, uh, both certified and classified. The 1.5 is the remaining funds that have been obligated but not yet spent down. So those funds have been approved by ADE but are, you know, could be amended uh, if there was a different purpose. And the remaining, you know, comes out to just over 6 million is our uh, LEA set aside. So a portion, 4 million has already, has been set aside uh, as part of our obligated amount. And the 1.9, gosh, it is really hard to see right here. And I have contacts, uh, but the 1.9 is what's already been expended. Did you want me to take that one? Sure. Um, there had been a, a request to kind of have an, a, an overview of where those dollars are actually being expended. Um, the total there of that 23 million on that prior slide is the light blue and the yellow. So it's the portion uh, that we've spent and encumbered. This does not include anything obligated. These are actual expenditures. It's the same number on two different slides. I broke this out into objects, objects being the the thing that we purchase. And so salaries and benefits, you can see, are taking up the largest portion of those dollars, 88%. Um, next is those purchase services in this. You can kind of see the alignment of that um, expenditure breakout does match a lot of the ESSER language of um, what we were prioritizing. And, and uh, it did go into salaries and benefits because teachers are what make the biggest effect on students. Um, and then we have some uh, smaller areas of some instructional materials. I know, I believe those were, Jasmine, do you remember the instructional materials piece? Was that part of the yeah. so reading? Part, so the 167, a big portion of that was for our SIPS program, which is a supplemental, a supplemental material we purchased to support our reading intervention program. Um, we have currently 15 reading interventionists across all of our sites, and we didn't have a common program for them all to implement. So SIPS was purchased, uh, that's a big portion of what that is, including also um, like embedded coaching to make sure that the materials were being appropriately used. I have a quick question. The rating intervention is that you just talked about, what grades do they target? Primarily K through three. So we have nothing in place for the upper grades. A few of the sites do uh, like flex their interventionists. So for example, if there is, um, you know, the, because of the way the master course schedule is, if there is an opportunity to have, let's say, this interventionist, these classes are all at, you know, recess, prep, da da da, they might also go serve fourth grade, let's say, but um, it's not intended to serve the, the higher grades. It's where possible, right? The model is primarily for uh, early literacy. Thank you. Of course. And then the next slide. So these are the same expenditures, but we're detailing these by function. Objects and functions are part of an account code string. Um, that's set to us in statute of uh, we all as school districts have to use those similar account code strings. I knew I could talk about account codes. Um, it is a puzzle and a story. It is amazing to me that you can have a string of numbers and know so much. And this is another piece of it is a function, so incredibly important. Uh, classroom function, 1,000, that means those are direct dollars into the classroom. Uh, and you can see that that percentage is heavily weighted over there at the 43%. Direct student support, that's another um, function, that's the 2100s. I could go through all the numbers, but um, those are uh, the, the student support where that comes in direct contact with students. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry, because in ESSER, I don't have all of the back-end knowledge of what is happening there. In my mind, when I talk about budgets, I'm talking about nurses and um, uh, uh, OTs and PTs and speech and things like that, those tend to be those direct support areas in the grant. So we, that is where uh, the CJAs live. It's also where the, we have um, specialists, uh, CJA specialists, so some classified paraprofessionals who are also supporting in that capacity. Uh, originally in the grant, we had um, 
assistant principals, which I believe also kind of lived there in the in the student support bucket. There's a variety and I could, you know, we could generate a, a list and I think actually on the slides coming up, you'll get a, a clearer idea of what specific positions are, are headed in there. And then uh, do I you have a question? Go sorry. right ahead. So I sorry. apologize. Um, clarification, you said assistant principals are being paid out of ESSER funds? Sorry, originally they were in ESSER. We, we moved many positions into ESSER to create capacity in our m and and other budgets. That's part of the carry forward that you saw on the previous presentation. And, and I think it's important to note it didn't just generate that carry forward. It, so there was a decision that came forward from meet and confer several years ago to implement, um, I can't remember what the real name of it is, I'll call it what everyone calls it, the parity study. We did not have adequate funds to implement that in one year. We would have had to roll it out over four years. Rather than doing that, we implemented a plan where we rolled it all out in a single year with support. The, the recommendation for meet and confer was to use ESSER dollars to help support it. ESSER dollars were not eligible to directly support that pay increase. So the way we did it is we took groups of positions that were eligible to be paid out of ESSER and moved them into ESSER to create capacity in m and to provide all of those raises. And it was, it was a significant increase across most positions throughout our district um, and uh, attempted to do some correction of the uh, compression, although it, we were only able to solve about 15% of the compression. It is also how we got those, um, we were the first district to get our minimum wage up to $15 an hour. We funded that by moving those positions into ESSER. So they were never meant to live there. They were kind of placed there. It's kind of like when you have a balloon with ballast, right? So when you wanna go up, you have certain things, you're throwing them overboard. You know, you're going to go back and collect them up later. You're still going to have that weight. But in order to be able to get that lift, you've got to get them out of the balloon. We move positions out of the balloon so that way we could create that lift of those raises. Okay. That just makes sense. And I just had that clarifying question because it was my understanding that when we originally ran bonds, the assistant principal and principal are supposed to be paying out of those bonds so that money should have already been living somewhere. They are listed in the maintenance and operations override. And so there is, that is the primary funding source for our <coughs> assistant principals, our nurses, et cetera. In this case, you know, we, we are not a district that typically plays shell games with money, but in order to be able to meet the needs and what, so part of ESSER was also working with that pandemic relief group that was actually specified in ESSER 3 that you needed to have certain people at the table in order to make decisions about those funds. The combination of that group and meet and confer had a very clear message of prioritizing some of those things that we were doing with compensation. And there was no way to get there other than saying, what can we move into ESSER in order to be able to support those priorities? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then also uh, teacher support, another big chunk went to um, that piece. And then the rest is uh, much smaller percentages. But again, I think the takeaway there was that the majority of these monies have been spent on salaries and benefits, and the majority of these monies have gone directly into the classroom. Which we appreciate. And those are just numbers, straight out numbers, simple. <laughs> so moving forward and knowing that these funds are going away at the end of September, um, you know, we, we've really taken a hard look at what the continuing priorities are. Again, much of what was expressed in the public comment this evening, um, social, emotional learning and behavioral support stands high as a clear and present need. Um, and that comes out of the board committee that's working, the assistant principals group, much of the teacher feedback that's received, it's evident that that is really a high priority. In addition to that, the academic achievement gains that are, that are prioritized in our student outcomes focused governance work with very targeted populations and as well as what the strategic plan calls out in terms of growth goals for everybody and the 10 percent increases that we're working hard to achieve we've begun to make equity and justice and advocacy progress that clearly is not something that we have concluded um, my only one of the thoughts i was having while we were going over the equimetrics data is i wish we had it from you know, like two years ago, 
it's so hard to look at it now and see it in that yellow and and think of all the things that we, we have yet to do, but we don't really have something that we can say, well, what did it look like before we started this work over the last two years? What did we what did it look like before we used ESSER funds to partner with Wade and Benji? What did it look like before child justice advocates? I don't really have a good data set to show that. What we have now is something that says, hey, you know, we're a little bit beyond where peer peers are across the country, but it's hard to make a direct correlation. So, but we know that that priority remains family and community services through our through our family resource center and our um, community education team remain a high priority technology for learning before the pandemic we weren't quite yet one-to-one -one for all students now we've got technology all over the district in every child's hand and and it it requires a tremendous amount of um, infrastructure support not to mention the professional development associated with using those tools effectively and then oversight and continuity of services. These, these resources still have to be managed. They have to be accounted for. There's completion reports that have to be done. There's just a lot associated with using the money and then showing how the money was used. So what we want to talk about now is thinking specifically about positions, um, the kind of the two buckets of positions that exist within ESSER at the present time. Um, there are, there remain positions in ESSER that were, that did exist prior to the pandemic, but they were moved into ESSER to create capacity in, and carry forward in m &L. So much like what Jay described. Oh, sorry. I know it's okay. Um, so some of those positions still exist. They haven't yet been moved out. Um, and then there were positions that were created new in response to the pandemic-based need. So the two kinds of positions that remain in ESSER. So what we want to share with you tonight are three recommended sets of action steps based on those categories of, of positions. Um, the first action step is to move the remaining positions that existed prior to the pandemic back into their original funding source. So Vanessa Ms. Shapiro referenced several of those in her MO budget update. Um, so the list is here. We've gone through, we've combed through um, everything in order to ensure that those positions are identified to move back into their original funding source, which can either be MO. Some of them existed in our in our title entitlement grants that we had before. So we get Title I, Title II, Title III, Title IV, which is outside the purview of this particular conversation, but we could certainly bring additional information back about those because um, they're significantly smaller than ESSER. And so what we're now trying to do is get go from the pond back to the bathtub, but not the same way we were before, but with the right or the tools and the strategies that are going to impact those those existing priorities. Go ahead, Ms. Michaela. Um, are all positions that existed prior to the pandemic returning back to their original funding source? That is the that is the intent of the okay. recommendation. Yes. Um, one of the questions, I mean, one of the things that I think would help me understand this a little bit better too, and I don't know how my other colleagues feel. Curriculum coordinator, what does that look like? How much is that money? How much is it and how much of it is going to be starting being taken out? You know, how much are we paying our curriculum, curriculum coordinators? What What is the price of the, the two? So I, I only included in the budgeting process any of those positions that were previously funded out of M&O. Okay. Um, so, so these were previously, these are basically like the safe positions that we were already paying for these before ESSER funds kicked in. Exactly. And most of these, I would say most of these positions were paid out of a grant funding source. Okay. So I don't necessarily have, or, or I have, obviously I have the cost of all of them. The only dollars that I grabbed to pull into the budget process were the ones that were going to that were in MO before and are going back into M and O. Um, if we were are do we have a safeguard uh, that these will be covered by those grants? Are those we believe we do have capacity to address these positions. Okay. What I what we can do, we can absolutely give you dollar. Yes. I can't mm -hmm. do it off the top, but right. give you dollar figures associated with each of these positions. That's relatively easy to do. Um, we are actually in the process at, at this week of going through all the existing 
federal grants that we have and evaluating the capacity of those grants to accommodate these recommendations. Oh, okay. So that that is absolutely work that's happening. In fact, it's happening tomorrow and Thursday and it, until it's done. Got it. Thank you. Um, a couple of these positions too, they're th like you'll notice the 4.2 teacher on assignment instructional coach. There are some things associated with um, addressing one of our schools that was in very comprehensive school improvement. You'll recall a couple years ago, we actually had a school that was in an F status, and so it needed a little bit of additional support. Um, Creighton Virtual Academy has a portion of an instructional coach and a portion of some, uh, well, that's what it is, a portion of an instructional coach. So the rest of that instructional coach is paid out of regular Title I funds. And so that's why some of those numbers look a little strange. So then these are the, this is the list of positions that are being recommended to sustain um, based on available alternative funding sources. So either the additional capacity that exists now in MO or additional capacity that exists in grants due to carry forward. Um, so the contract subs, which we address, those had high impact, high value, uh, and are perceived to be very effective. The effective schools coordinator, um, I can speak to that directly because that's Jasmine, um, but the continuation of that role is, is essential to making sure that the department runs well. There's also um, the child justice and advocacy program is in there. The, you know, the thinking around that, and I recognize that it's a controversial role. What we've done in our data collection has revealed that the perceived value of the child justice advocacy role is, 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 appears to be very personnel dependent. So it, the more, and I would say that that's true likely with anybody on that, any role on that list. The perception of the value directly correlates to the experience we have with the people in that role. So there are, there's, that's why the little asterisk at the bottom indicates that everything we would put here has to would have to, to some degree, be realigned in order to fit within an existing Title I grant or within an existing federal grant um, if we're using federal funds. So the best example I can give you is with Title I right now or even ESSER, it's really hard to get anything approved that speaks directly to social emotional learning because it's just such a hot button, political, politicized, weaponized body of work. So, we'll need to be able to get whatever this is ultimately through the grant approval process. So we're looking at systematizing the work of the child justice advocates in a way that draws on things like executive function, peer-to-peer um, -peer relationships, and um, communication. All of those fall under the umbrella of culturally practice. They fall under the umbrella of equity and inclusion, but they they have the right labels that match the what is likely to be possibly funded. So just to clarify, some of these positions, they might stay the same in name, but the roles and responsibilities and expectations of them might have to be changed I due would, to sorry to step on you. The funding that they're coming out of essentially. I would say yes and the like some of the names might even have to change if we can't get them through a grant approval process. But the intent, and again, I'll go back to child justice and advocacy because it's such a top, it's it's so present. Um, the intent there was to create a, a role that could support the intersection of social and emotional learning, behavioral support, and equity. So we tried to create a, a different concept and way to frame that body of work as it would be needed to be implemented in schools to improve outcomes for children and to support teachers. There's lots of ways we can, I think, talk about that without losing the intent. I don't know that those terms will make it through uh, grant approval at this time. Do you, are, do we currently have a, a full service community schools grant through the federal government or no? We do not. Yeah. I think that's one to look into as something that would probably not, that would probably be 
encompassing of what you're discussing. Full I think, I mean, it's like wraparound services. Mm -hmm. It was during the um, Obama administration, obviously went away, is back now in the Biden administration. Um, full service community mm -hmm. schools grant. Thank you. Well, that's a whole other um, element to this conversation is yeah. seeking alternative <laughs> options for saying. funding sources, which have, is which is important. Yeah. And that's the kind of feedback and ideas that we're looking for. I have more at the end of this presentation. Yeah. And Dr. Dupin, just to add real quick, since we're talking about the sustain um, um, positions, I think what would be helpful for us too, especially since a child ju justice advocacy um, positions are in here, effective schools coordinator, I'm not really sure what that role is. If we can get information on the last two years, what these positions have done, how they've progressed, have we seen any progress? Is there any data attached that, you know, what we originally attended these positions for have actually done the outcome that we expected them to have? just because I have a hard time voting yes, let's sustain these positions where I'm not even sure what an effective schools coordinator does or what their role is or what they have done in the last two years that this position has been created. Mm -hmm. So if we can get a little bit more information on specifically the, the um, positions that we want to try to sustain is how they've, what outcomes do we have from those positions? Yes, absolutely. We might want to hear from the, teachers as well on their perspective on it as well because I feel like sometimes we might not get the true picture without their their voice as well as what they because sometimes like as a teacher I the district may have a different standpoint from what I actually see happening within my school um, and so it could be a different perspective so that might be like some good data to bring back as well not just and I'll defer that to our cabinet to figure out how to make that happen. I think that too helps because I know, as you were mentioning earlier, we don't have as much as far as the numerical numerical data, right, um, for specific correlations. But there are ways we can get feedback from teachers. And I think it also helps in providing guidance if some of these positions might need to change kind of what they look like in the day to day. Maybe that feedback not just on is this position valuable and having the impact it is but also okay in areas where you're still seeing gaps maybe if we're reframing some of these positions the feedback from teachers could help guide that as well Thank I, I think that's valuable i think the other thing that it would be helpful for us to provide is um sort of what are the other funding opportunities and what are um what are the intentions with the position? So um, I'll use the CJAs as an example. There are a number of grants that are available out there that those positions are eligible for. Yeah. Um, you know, we heard advocacy for reading interventionists. We'd love to find a bunch of extra funding sources for those reading interventionists, but they they don't fit into things like um, the, the some of the federal safety grants and, and some of those pieces. They're very specific about what you can use those dollars for. Um, we are just as concerned about the effectiveness of those positions and what we've gotten out of them over the last two years as the people that you've heard speak today. But we're also working from a fairly large data set that tells us that one of the number one concerns from our teachers is behavior. So to eliminate the position, if it's not effective, is fine, but we can't give up on finding solutions to these behavior challenges. And one of the things that we've come to realize is we really need a program. And we have had the opportunity in some of the conferences that we've attended to see neighboring school districts using programs that are quite effective. Mm -hmm. And so we, we want our committee that's looking into that to look at those programs. The concern and the challenge that we have is let's say we selected, we look, went to one of the neighbor districts and it's like, oh my goodness, this is the answer to everything. Um, if we don't restructure a position like that to support the implementation of that program, then all of that burden falls on principals and teachers. Yeah. And what we're really fundamentally trying to do is not put more burden on those individuals. So I'm not advocating specifically for that position. Um, and if it 
if it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck, then it's a duck. So, you know, if we end up in a position where we have a funding source to retain something similar to that and we use it in a different way, you know, what I would ask people to please do is watch, watch whatever this creature is. And then if it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, all of our doors are open. Tell us it's walking like a duck and quacking like a duck. But if it soars like an eagle and it's actually making an impact, then let's not just throw it out. But because... I, I think moving forward, we need to be intentional and we can do more. Like, I, I know I worked in high schools. I was in wraparound services. I worked in programs where all we did was tier two and tier three interventions and pulled kids out of classrooms and did home visits. And like, it was just like hard work every day. And we had to keep data. We had to be able to present why we were so valuable on the campuses we were at and earn my salary. Like I had to earn my salary every year. I was hosting grant people and walking them around and being like, this is what we've been doing. Here's all of the results I've gotten. Um, and, and I ran a pro I developed and then ran a program at three different high schools in Portland because of the success I was able to show through data. Now I know so oftentimes it's really hard to quantify some of those successes in, in this realm, but there's a way to do it, but you got to have to plan it ahead of time uh, and be keeping that data because then we're in this position where we don't have anything to really measure things with right again then you have this this like issue of individuals in the positions right obviously there's going to be issues with what kind of quality you're getting and pay and how that all works out but you know um i, I mean i could just go on and on about this i i think that obviously there is a need for this i would hate to see all of that fall back on tier two and tier, like the tier two and tier three things can't just be dumped on principals and vice principals and whoever. Um, and if this isn't working correctly or people are just like slacking, like that's not cool either. So we have to figure it out and figure it out fast. We don't have time to be wasting to figure out, is this working? And I understand the need to like take our time and evaluate. I, I, there just has to be a sense of urgency with that because I would hate for us to continue to waste time and hear that that, that this is just, things are not being implemented in the ways that they're supposed to be. I would love to see some data moving forward if we were to continue to keep this program for the next year to like make it very clear that this is what our expectations are to see what happens from the beginning of the school year to the end of the school year. I don't know what those metrics look like, what those measurables would be. Maybe they can tell us, or maybe teachers and staff and principals can tell us, but I think there's something there that has to be shown if then there's a long-term conversation. Um, I know I, I just mentioned that grant. I don't know if we get any 21st century dollars. Um, we do. We do. Some schools. Okay. Like I said before, you know, in, in my, and I, I I know I'm not the end all be all of this, but like I saw how we could integrate the, we, my, my program was existing. We also integrated becoming an AmeriCorps VISTA site into that. We integrated BSW and MSW interns into that. So they weren't like, because you can't replace, obviously with the VISTA, you can't replace existing positions, but there's so many ways to leverage resources and make this work. Um, and, and integrate that and then also still have those partnerships with the community partners that we already have in the schools to kind of have things working cohesively. Um, and I, I know that some of that's happening to some extent. It's just there's not a lot to show for it in terms of data is what I'm trying to say. And so it's hard to hear that, not see any data and then decide, trying to have to decide, well, what are we going to prioritize when we don't don't know what value to place on things? Yeah, and I, and I think I think something that's important to clarify so um, this team's been working on this for s seven months now. Yeah. We have identified that when we don't have strong data sets to bring it back, but we have the anecdotal data like what was shared with you tonight. Yeah. We know the program is not universally effective. Yeah. So we're not coming to you saying this isn't as effective as we'd like it to be. We'd like to continue it. Mm -hmm. What we're coming to you and saying is what we're doing isn't working the way we want it to work. But we can't just say, let's just eliminate those FTE and say, good luck, teachers, right? Yeah. We, we need to fix it and we need to make it work. And so it is my expectation, and I think this team's expectation, that we should be looking at everything with data. We've implemented a new SIPS program for reading intervention. 
How effective is our reading intervention? We should know that. If it's effective, we should double down on it. If it's ineffective, we need to change up what we're doing with reading intervention. If we bring it, if we bring into play reading or math intervention, you know, at that four through eight level, we should be tracking: Are we getting results from it or not? So we're, you know, we're on a process. We're on a pathway to student outcomes focused governance. The goal of the team is to be able to track all of this and have it be accountable. But I can't. My challenge is, I, you know, I'm hearing a lot of people's frustrations from prior years, yeah. and I, and yes, I was here, and and I was in at many times as frustrated as people you're hearing share, mm -hmm. but I can't go back to the past and yeah. change the way things were done or, or were implemented. The only thing we can do is make certain that we're bringing data forward as we move forward. It's why you saw the Equimetrics data. Mm -hmm. You know, we're trying to become very data informed in what we're doing. We are blessed and fortunate to have people like um, Dr. Pombo with us now who are teaching data-wise to our, our leadership teams at our sites. And we're drilling in on student data in ways that, I mean, I don't, the people in the audience could tell you better than me, but I don't think we've drilled down in that way for more than a decade. So um, none of this is gonna happen overnight. Right. And so if people are frustrated because we're seven months in and it all hasn't magically been transformed, what I would say is look to the changes that are being made incrementally. Those will have an impact over the long term. And, and we can't, you know, <laughs> So some of these things that are water under the bridge, we've got no way to go and go back and fix what happened. But I also don't want to just give up and say, oh, well, I guess we can't affect student behavior. Good luck. I hope I hope things work out in your class. I 100% agree with the comments that we heard tonight that first best instruction is an effective behavior strategy. Every child in every classroom is engaged all the time. What I'd like to see them engaged in is the instruction. If they are not engaged in the instruction, they will be engaged in something else, and you'll and you'll end up with incidents like the incidents we heard shared with us tonight. So it is definitely a key factor in what we're doing. But I don't think we can, when I talk to our neighbors and I look at these programs that they've implemented, they're having the same problems we're having. They have much one of those districts I worked for in the past. I helped implement some of the the um, strong first tier instruction in that district they are strong in that area already they are still dealing with behavior problems they are implementing these programs they're putting staff behind these programs and they're starting to see improvements in some of those behavior challenges so i just don't want to give up on trying to fix the problem because what was implemented hasn't been as effective universally across the board as we wanted it to be. And I apologize if I'm speaking totally, in a Totally, and I correct. also don't want to see a divisiveness yep. between like we like a one or the other yep. thing. Like we need reading interventionists and we need people who are providing these supports. We need we need both. Yes. It has to be a multi-pronged approach. And that's why I brought up like the clarification earlier. Like we can we can be renaming these positions. We can be reframing them even if the name is the same. Because I agree, I don't want to get rid of FTEs if we don't have to, especially because that does fall directly back on our principals, on our APs. And it also falls back on every teacher who is dealing with that and feeling like they're not as supported because there's one or two less humans on the campus to support them, regardless of what their title is. Um, but yes, moving forward, because we are not time travelers making sure that we have some data because there are going to be difficult decisions. And at the heart of all this, like we're looking at titles, these are humans. Mm -hmm. So we also need to keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm jumping the gun, but I'm looking at the concluding and going back to the SOFG framework that we're taking, Ray, and kind of bringing up Ms. Ariel's point is that I understand everything. However, for example, conclude, Creighton Virtual Academy office manager conclude principal at Creighton Virtual Academy. Um, I'm not sure why in these slides and the bottom where it says priority, I remember our online school being one of our priorities and before, but it's not in here. I must have seen it some, in another slide or maybe I'm jumping ahead to next. That's in the appendix. Okay. Um, but what I'm seeing um, here is that 
Um, we have, we may not have had data on the, the behavior issues, but what we are hearing still is that for the past two years, whatever stuff we have implemented hasn't really been working. We're still having the same behavior issues, but here we have data that shows our student outcomes aren't where they're supposed to be. And whether that was an oversight on the board or administration of we should have funded our online academy a little bit better or not, we're so quickly to conclude that when we have 32 students that are basically going to be left with, oh, this is it, whatever. Um, and that's, I feel personally, what has gotten us to the data points that we have right now that we're always leaving it up to like, oh, well, we didn't do our job well enough or we weren't stewards of our money. So now we're in this position. Let's Oh, well, let's let's move on to the next. And from the points and from the feedback I'm getting from these slides, that's what it's seeming to me as we're prioritizing um, people's position over the students. And if for the past few years we've had certain positions that till this day we have no data or we have no concrete evidence that it has implemented or worked in a certain way, then we need to to Ms. Gibson McLean's point is we need to act fast because our students are suffering from it, especially those 32 online students. And I know that's a different um, kind of conversation, but it's it's just daunting to me to see that we're so quick to get rid of um, you know a system that has 32 kids that are going to be left with no other options, but we're willing to keep other jobs that maybe in the two years from what I've heard, we don't really have any concrete data of behaviors increasing because of these positions. And that's about, if I read correctly, that's about eight, nine, 10. They have assistants, they have a universal coach and eight. That's like about 12 positions just for one. Um, I know that yes, stewardship, and maybe we haven't really talked about that, the work that Corwell um, and Wade did, that's a huge implementation of creating that positive behavior culture. So maybe we emphasized on that. I also know that we have one, um, specific school right now that's operating almost at a 500 school capacity without an assistant principal while all the other schools have an assistant principal too. So there's a lot of stuff that we really need to start focusing on and making sure that our budget is aligning to what we're saying. If we want to bring up these student outcomes, then maybe we should focus on reading intervention. We have nothing higher. Math, one of our you know, goals is to make sure that our eighth grade students can pass math. We have no intervention in math. So there's a lot of stuff that we do have to talk about. And I think we do have an urgency and it's not, well, let's continue to see if this works. We've had the two years. If the data is not there, then we're going to have to start making some difficult decisions. It is what it is. And, and I just want to, I just want to correct something that, that I'm concerned might be a misunderstanding here. This shows the office manager and the principal for the Creighton Virtual Academy as reductions that is not intended to be that we're closing that program out. It's just that a principal to support 31 students is not a full-time position, and an office manager to support 31 Got students it. is not a full-time position. So um, originally, and I know we're a little behind the eight ball with bringing back information to you on, on the possibilities for future virtual academy, but when we get to that presentation, and I believe it might have been included in the information in the last board in update, part of what's built into the cost models for each of the options is a percentage of a principal and a percentage of an office manager and so they're they're backed out as full positions here because they're coming out of the ESSER funding but if we maintain the the ongoing programmatic element of the virtual academy we would then have to budget in that i don't know if it was a point two or a point three for a principal and an office manager, and we're not gonna get a point two or a point three. So we're gonna need to look at where do we have other things that are happening in the district that don't require 1.0 and combine some things together. And there may be some synergies in combining, say a, a smaller school principal with that person also having oversight for that virtual academy. So there, there may be a way to accomplish that where the smaller school is okay with a point eight and that person's always physically on grounds, is okay with the point eight office manager, and that person's always physically on grounds, but 20% of the time they're helping to support that virtual academy. So I just, I just don't want to create a misconception that this is assuming closing the virtual academy. Those conversations have not happened yet. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Can I get clarification on, just because it's a term that can be used very broadly, 
the 13 instructional specialists. Yes, so when we did the literacy intensification role, one of the components of that role was a paraprofessional position. So at the present time, there are 13 paraprofessional positions that exist across the district that are deployed to support a variety of, of purposes. Some of them do indeed work within the reading classroom to lower group size. Some of them do other things. They, they exist to fulfill a variety of paraprofessional roles across the campus. So it was part of the literacy intensification priority. So, and essentially, it's not that we wouldn't have parapros at all. This is just the 13 Those. additional ones that we created to provide additional support. That is correct. Okay. And there may be further conversations about these as we look for ways to sustain them, because we had, you know, we've had conversations in, in leadership council and some other spaces. There was, I believe this was one of the positions there was strong advocacy for. Mm -hmm. So it is where we, it's not like we're ignoring the feedback we're getting. This is where we're at at this moment in time. Mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to figure out how do, how do we effectively absorb that feedback. The challenge always becomes, and, and this is the challenge I had to throw out there for people. If we want to keep this, then what are we giving up instead, right? When you have a household budget and you decide you want to add another streaming service, does that mean you're giving up some Starbucks or a different streaming service or you're not eating out one night a week? So, you know, it's the same thing when you deal with the school budget. If you want to have 13 instructional specialists that you hold on to that the funding source has gone away, what else is it that we feel like we would like to give up in order to support? And also just to add um, a quick side note is that we are losing some staff due to these ESSER funds. I know that we just recently lost a great um, parent liaison to our neighboring district, which I'm excited for them, but we really do need to act on this because um, we have certain employees that are starting to get scared and I would hate to be in a position where we're doing this last minute too and they don't know. I do not like I would hate it if I didn't know if I was going to have a job tomorrow or the next month or whatever. So we really want to be cautious of that too before we start losing more staff because of the unsureness of what's going on. We need to be very proactive. I mean, yes, and not reactive. I said that correctly. <laughs> um, with that, um, Mr. Mann, I'm, I agree with you. I think, you know, yes, if, if, specialists are a priority, then there is something else that has to be given up. So my ask would be only because as a principal, I've been in these conversations for six months where my district has come with a plan based on the numbers, based on what, you know, was created as ESSER positions. And as principals, we've all come back and said, no, these are non-negotiables. These are priorities. And yes, I am willing for my site. And it's varied at different sites, you know, at my site, we can do with one less of this. Um, so I just ask that that is the principal's feedback is taken very seriously and that those conversations are happening very frequently, especially right now um, as we move forward into making these decisions because no offense to our district level cabinet, but at the site, we, we see things that are prioritized differently and it doesn't have to, I bring up that it's different, it can be different in each site too because that's important. It does make it a little messier, but it's important that each site has the priorities for what they need. And we're working. Well, what, yeah. And what ultimately what the students are going to need and that we stay away from, you know, what's going to keep us safe, but what's going to be the better outcome for these students. And I would, yes, and that to say, as we work through this process, one of the things that we're getting triangulated feedback around is the idea that there does need to be consistency. So I'll revisit the child justice advocates, for example, some of, I think what we're hearing is based on different approaches to implementation and support. So when Mr. Mann's talking about programmatic alignment or implementing a program, that whether it's reading intervention or child justice and advocacy or tier one instruction, there need to be some common elements that are just to, you know, for that non-negotiable piece and recognizing each campus does have really interesting and f delightful <laughs> challenges. <laughs> so we're trying to, to balance those pieces. So this is our timeline. Just Sorry, no, I just wanted please. one more clarification on the last one. Of course. Um, <laughs> the last bullet, like what does that mean? Okay, so 
this speaks to, you know, at any given time, we have a number of vacancies and we have people right now to President Carrillo's point, people are making decisions about what they're going to do for next year. So we anticipate the ability to absorb all these positions into other existing vacancies. It may not be the exact same role. I'll use the intensification class size reduction or flex teachers. There's 15 positions. We typically hire 65 to 80 or more teachers in any given year. So the ability to find um, assign roles for these individuals is, is highly likely without anybody losing their, their job. Okay, so, so they, the last they, bullet doesn't mean we'd be removing positions that might increase class sizes because Class size is a conversation that will be happening at meet and confer. So at this moment in time, our current class size ratio is 27.5 to 1. That remains unless we get a different recommendation from meet and confer. Okay. Just because when I read the bullet, it to me it sounded like we have 15 positions that were meant to reduce class sizes, and if we get rid of them, they'll go back up. And I, I think was... I misunderstood your question because the when we started with the literacy intensification priority, we kind of rolled out literacy intensification for K-5, and then an EL support role for 6-8. That was the initial intent. And then what happened was the need was actually around like needing to provide some of that school level flexibility. And some buildings just really needed to reduce class size. So they, so we added the flexibility to allow the principals to use those positions in different ways. So some did do class size reduction. Some stayed with that original model of literacy intensification. And then the flex position was a, you know, a kind of a way to fill gaps and holes and or create new kinds of programming. So that's an, an example of one priority turned into three different types of implementation. And in actual practice, the majority of these individuals, correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, but the majority of these individuals ended up being plugged into vac position vacancies. So it wasn't necessarily that, you know, there's 15 extra teachers. It wasn't necessarily that each of the eight schools had two extra teachers. They had these two people hired for these positions, but then they had two holes that didn't get filled. So these individuals filled those two holes. So moving forward, this is the intended timeline that we have in place, and this may need to adjust based on our conversation this evening. Um, tomorrow's meet and confer, the same conversation is going to be part of that uh, interest-based negotiation discussion. And then we're looking at being able to, to, on the 13th, provide preliminary staffing allocations to the sites and uh, to the principals in particular. And what that is, is your list of how many teachers you're going to get next year based on a projected enrollment. And then with that, then you kind of know, you can start knowing where you can, where people can slot into from that list on the slide prior. And then also factoring into this is the, is the idea that we're opening Kennedy School next year. So back to that slide, people who may not have an ESSER funded position, we're opening a whole new building where there will be vacancies that we anticipate staff will be able to move into. Um, and then moving forward with a goal of issuing contracts by March, February 23rd. So it's a, it's a closed timeline. Yeah. And, and, and to, to your comment about like, how does this timeline align? Um, but within the last six or seven years in Arizona, because of the teacher shortage, districts have moved up when they do their contracts over and over again so it used to be normal to do contracts in like march april time frame like i remember you know in the early 2000s we did most contracts in april it is more commonplace now when, when i talk to my peers like several of our neighbors have that same february 20th 23rd date so that is everything's kind of moved up it's kind of like when people started competing for kindergartners it used to be kindergartners had all their info sessions in march now people are doing it as early as December. Most people do it in January or February. And it's just a lot of that also has been affected by the school year moving back into August to accommodate the testing window. So, so if, if I can summarize just some of the feedback and takeaways for the team in the next two weeks, <clears throat> what I heard was a desire to get more information about what those positions cost 
any of the impact data that we may have, it sounds like the greatest interest is really around the child justice and advocacy role, um, including teacher perspectives. And, well, and then, I'd say with that, the impact of some of those instructional specialists, was there po significant positive impact? Got it. I think the impact of all of it is important. And then framing that, I th and please tell me if I'm on the right track, kind of framing it into some structure, you know, given the capacity of our existing grants, how much of that could actually be sustained? Because like our title, Title I budget, for example, is we anticipated it's going to be somewhere around, you know, three and a half million dollars. I'm being optimistic. So, you know, you're going from 32 million down to three. That's that's the scope of the of the of the challenge. So is, does that sound accurate? For me, it does. I don't know if anybody else has any other questions, comments, feedback. Sounds accurate. And I know it sounds weird, but moving forward, even if it's a pain in the butt. But if it means we can have the positions that we need, I mean, even I've been in positions before where we've had to like almost like billables, you know, as the employee explain what work we did that would fit into what grant. I mean, if it has to come to that, it has to come to that so that we can make things work as a puzzle. But I think that's an, a, a thing that could be done as long as people are trained correctly, especially with the wraparound services. I think I think we do some of that now with time and effort logs. Is I yeah. think the current parlance that's used for it. So. That's correct. For the <clears throat> for the again going back to the fact that these are humans. For the notice of position discontinuation, um, one have any of those conversations started informally, and then two were all of those positions were all of those humans told when they were hired explicitly that it might very much might be temporary. So I'm going to, I'm going to say based on our expectations, yes. And yes, yeah. there, you know, everybody who was hired into an ESSER funded position, the, the direction at the time was to ensure that they were aware that these were f positions funded with one-time dollars, one-time funds is how we talked about it. I think where it might be a little shaky is with like those literacy intensification features. If they're filling a regular third or a fourth or an eighth grade class, it is possible that they may not even know that, that the accounting behind their role is tied to ESSER. So I would say that's the one area where it's That's a why bit more I asked, gray. because I've seen that happening in other districts where people were moved into ESSER who had been with the district and were not aware that they were moved into ESSER. But, but what I will say is for, for most of those individuals, if you were moved into a third or fourth or fifth grade position, even though the position you were originally hired into was funded out of ESSER and is going It'll away, out the them. third or fourth or fifth grade position still exists, yeah. right? So, you know, it's not like there's a line of teachers waiting to come in and take that job away from that person. So, you know, I, I don't know, you know, the extent to which that's going to have an impact on those individuals. And what we really need to figure out very quickly is, you know, how do we how do we find which groups maybe don't have clarity and make sure that we provide that clarity to those groups? And the only other question or feedback I have is that a February 20th is the notification of position discontinuation, but our board meeting is that day. Isn't that a premature, um, a premature date if you haven't even heard final feedback from the board? I think it is. That's one of the adjustments that we could, could make. Yeah, if you can just do the discontinuation of the posting of notifications until you have that conversation with us after the 20th so you guys have the feedback of what the board is thinking and one of the things that we had talked about that in terms of procedure is it's not just like you know a letter that says here your position is no longer continuing it would be the intent is that it's a conversation so next week we're having a principals meeting to talk about you know like to provide a list like here are the positions that exist on your campus that are tied to ESSER so they can look at it and make sure that they have that accurate understanding and begin to then prepare what those conversations might look like so it, it's not just a because the approach is going to be different for different kinds of positions feature it's just a matter of hey you know the the accounting behind your position is different now but here's the thinking next year if this same job exists it's going to be different funding source but it still exists um in some cases the 
the funding for the current positions going away, but here are a list of positions we anticipate being vacant that you are qualified for that you could apply for in the transfer process. Okay. I mean, it says finalized selection process for principal at Kennedy School on the 20th. Does that, that doesn't mean the board is voting on it that day. It We're working very like... hard to bring to you a recommendation for that role on February. Okay. We have it anticipate, we are working on interviews for next week. Okay. At a robust pool of candidates. Oh. And a robust interview team. And a robust interview <laughs> team. And we have a Zella testing happening right now, which is sort of colliding getting all that input into the decision but our objective is to bring a recommendation that night i would just say if the position discontinuation notification is delayed at all it needs to be delayed very minimally um yeah like two days or three days i'm just like, saying until yeah. we have our feedback and you know there's a way of having some informal conversations you know from principal to staff member and things because and I do think that a lot of those informal conversations have been having. Okay. What I can't guarantee is that they've had, that they've occurred for everyone or that yeah. we've reached all voices. But this has been coming for three years and we're kind of just at that point where it's painful and, but it's, but it's present. And, and... Okay. Well, do we have any other questions, comments? Perfect. I want to thank everybody. I know this is a really hard conversation, but just know that first and foremost, we're putting our students first and our money and our resources needs to really put into the kids. So um, just keep that in mind as we're having these conversations. Um, and with that said, that brings us to future agenda items. Do we have any future agenda items? I have um, a couple. If we can do a family resource update, I would love to hear from our family resource center, have them present, talk about the awesome things they're doing, our community education as well at some point. And, um, oh, and I would like to put bond conversation, to have a bond conversation at some point. That one may need a study session, so. Oh, yeah, and yeah, a study session for the bond, yes. And you just made Vanessa very happy. <laughs> I've been okay. working hard for that study session. Awesome. And then just wagging, the one that I put on opening campuses after hours, I'm looking at all the other ones other than the one for the update for CVA in March. I think mine probably has some budget implications that we should consider before. Like if we can get some information so that maybe we could try to see what that would look like. And then I thought it was my understanding too that the Sorry, go ahead and finish that. I'm sorry. I was done. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was my understanding that the future Creighton Virtual Academy needs to be put on the next board meeting, just because we've been pushing that so, so much. We're trying for that March meeting. We just need to confirm the availability of the presenters. So it'll either be that one or the following one, depending on presenter availability. Okay. Um, this has been on the board for two to three months. Is there a reason why we haven't reached out to them in the last two to three months to make sure they could be here for the 20th? Some conversations. Okay. Um, I think that needs to be ASAP, but we'll have the discussion in our one on one. Okay. Anything else? All right. I move the governing board adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Buenas noches. Thank you, everybody, for coming.